right by now, right? Right. Never. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Cochran, the CEO and executive director of the one and only uh, United States Conference of Mayors here in Washington, D.C., representing uh, the mayors of this great nation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual summit on reimagining a public safety. Some years ago, a former president of this organization, Wellington Webb of Denver in 1999, when he spoke to the German parliament that day, he said, if you do not have a safe city, you do not have a city. Conference of mayors here in Washington, D.C., representing uh, the mayors of this great nation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual summit on reimagining a public safety. Some years ago, a former president of this organization, Wellington Webb of Denver, said, if you do not have a safe city, you don't have a city. And this has been a guiding principle for our organization for decades. We have had strong policy in support of gun safety measures since 1968 and we have advocated in Washington since then. We've been convening meetings on mayors and police chiefs. And we want to thank Mayor Lightfoot, Mayor Cranley of, of Cincinnati, and also Mayor Castor of Tampa for their leadership, along with Chuck Ramsey, who followed through with President Fisher's American Breakthrough this year to create great work that's on the shelf and ready to be added to the work that we're gonna be doing over the next two days. As we have undertaken efforts to address the root causes of crime and violence in our cities, poverty, lack of jobs, and economic opportunity has troubled schools and unsafe and unaffordable housing. These efforts continue today and tomorrow in this summit, which is truly the vision of our great president, Mayor Greg Fisher. It is my pleasure to turn this over now to Mayor Fisher, who will preside over today's sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I want to thank you and the whole staff at the conference for putting this together. Laura Waxman in particular has been outstanding along with my team, Kenny Dalinger and Jen Cavino. So a lot goes into putting these conferences on. So just thanks to everybody. Uh, folks, we've reached an inflection point in the ongoing fight to reverse the tragic increase that we're seeing in gun violence in the cities across the United States. We've seen a staggering 33% increase in gun homicides in major American cities in just this past year. And this epidemic of preventable tragedies have left you, the mayors of our country, me and people all across our country, heartbroken, angry, and I would say even more determined to turn on over every rock to see what is it that we can do to make our streets safer for everybody. This is obviously occurring at the same time that we're also responding to uh, justifiable increased calls for racial justice in our country, including the need to reimagine public safety, all set against the backdrop of COVID-19 and the corresponding economic downturn of that, and now it's coming out of the pandemic, hopefully. And so we put all those things together, and that's why we organized this summit, to help mayors, uh, councils, uh, police chiefs, activists, and others who care about public safety to share ideas and gain insights into how we can take these challenges and make the critical progress that the cities or that the people of the cities of America demand and deserve. We've got a great lineup of speakers and experts who are going to address a variety of topics, including the federal government's role in helping cities through funding. We'll talk about national standards in policing, and we'll discuss lessons learned over the past year, including how to safely handle large public protests. As mayors, uh, many of us also essentially serve as the commander in chief of our city during crises. So we need to consider questions like, what kind of training do we need as mayors? How can we better serve our cities and improve public safety? So I hope those are some of the questions that we'll work to answer over the next two days. And we're blessed with some really great partners to help us answer these questions. Putting this summit together, we reached out to two organizations to bring their uh, capabilities to us. One, uh, Cities United and the executive director there, Anthony Smith. Second, Every Town for Gun Safety and their senior director of local initiatives, Katie Duda. 
Anthony and Katie and their teams have been vital partners with the conference here in creating this summit. And I want to thank them at the beginning of this. And we always uh, appreciate our outstanding partners at Bloomberg Philanthropies for the many ways they support our work, including Mayor Mike Bloomberg, starting Mayors Against Illegal Guns, which eventually became Every Town. So thanks to each and every one of you all. Now, one of the additional goals for this summit was to provide uh, mayors and anybody with the background information on each of the topics that we're gonna be discussing so that you could share with your community stakeholders the, that information as you build out your strategies to create safer cities. And you can find all of those materials at usmayors.org. We've got a dedicated page just to the, this summit and all of the materials that you need to have. So let's get started. Uh, for our first session, we're gonna take a look at the root causes of gun violence with an outstanding panel that offers a wide variety of perspectives. First up will be Dr. Shawnee Bugs, Assistant Professor, Violence Prevention Research Program at the University of California, Davis. Next will be Eduardo Bocanagra, Senior Director, Ready Chicago, an innovative violence prevention program in the Windy City, and a brand new father as of about six hours ago. Nice job, not for the first time though. And then Christopher Tuex of uh, Christopher Tuex Game Changers, uh, my fellow Louisvillian, whose nonprofit promotes early childhood education, parental involvement, mentoring, and community involvement with families that have suffered gun violence. They'll be joined by three outstanding mayors on our panel Sylvester Turner, Mayor of Houston, Libby Schaff, Mayor of Oakland, and Quentin Lucas, the Mayor of Kansas City, Missouri. Each presenter will go for about five minutes, and then mayors will be opening the floor to you for questions and observations. So Professor Bugs, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. FEMA defines a disaster as, quote, an event that results in large numbers of deaths and injuries, causes extensive damage or destruction of facilities that provide and sustain human needs, produces an overwhelming demand on state and local response resources and mechanisms, causes a severe long-term effect on general economic activity and severely affects state, local and private sector capabilities to begin and sustain response activities. By FEMA's own definition, many communities in the United States, communities that are home to mostly low-income Black, Latinx or other marginalized people of color have been plagued by a disaster for far too long, a disaster that is community gun violence. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare racial, health, and economic inequities throughout our nation. It also exacerbated the inequity of gun violence in black and brown communities. While we do not yet have final counts or estimates from last year, dozens of US cities, large and small, have experienced record increases in gun violence that coincided with the impact of the pandemic. With the nationwide totals currently approximated as Mayor Fisher said, at about 30% higher in 2020 than in 2019. And like the effects of the pandemic, the effects of gun violence will last long after the vaccines have been distributed. But unlike COVID-19, gun violence in the US has been the leading cause of death for black males 15 to 34 years old, and the second leading cause of death for black females and Latinx males 15 to 24 years old, since the 1980s. We have failed to save thousands of young lives from gun violence each year and thousands of families from the devastating loss of their loved ones for over a generation because we have failed to address gun violence as a problem of structural inequities, one caused by decades of trauma and disinvestment and mass incarceration by policies and practices that excluded communities of color from wealth building and stability and by a societal indifference to black and brown suffering. And because gun violence is both the cause and consequence of disinvestment, our communities with high rates of gun violence have been unable to attract and sustain economic developments that can help break the cycle. But we now have a once in a generation opportunity to begin to repair those structural harms. The recent commitments from the Biden-Harris administration to invest in community violence intervention and to invest specifically in marginalized communities of color are potentially game-changing. 
The American Rescue Plan Act will deliver billions of dollars to your states and millions of dollars to your counties and cities to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Treasury Department has issued guidance that those dollars can be used for community violence intervention. With the annual cost of gun violence in the US estimated at nearly $280 billion and the huge returns on investment that we can get by investing in prevention, using ARP funds for this purpose should be an easy priority. And President Biden's jobs plan with its commitments to spur economic development and address structural determinants of health and safety has the real potential to counter the inequities that drive the violence we see today. You as mayors have an amazing chance to genuinely reimagine public safety with these federal investments. And following 2020, when we collectively witnessed nationwide uprisings against police violence, you have an extraordinary opportunity to fund peace, to allocate significant amounts of money towards community-based violence intervention and prevention strategies led by members of the very communities most impacted by the destruction of violence. You have the chance to let your communities lead the way towards safety, to listen intently to their needs, and then act to deliver. You have the opportunity to equitably invest in mitigating this disaster and developing comprehensive solutions that will create safe communities. Over the past decade, and now as part of a group of black and brown gun violence prevention leaders known as the Fund Peace Coalition, I have had the privilege of conducting and sharing research about what works to reduce community violence with local, state, and federal policymakers. But it has been more than an academic exercise. I have also had the honor of seeing the research in action by working alongside phenomenal practitioners, experts, and advocates who save lives every day by pouring care and resources into people and helping them to heal, to move from just surviving to thriving. Eddie Bocanegra, is one of those people. And I will now turn the mic over to him. Thank you to Anthony Smith with Cities United, Mayor Fisher and Tom Cochran and the entire conference for allowing me to join you today. Thank you, Dr. Bugs. Um, let me start out by just building on some of the comments you shared as well. You know, gun violence in our city, the truth, honesty is really a matter of racial inequity. Um, the communities that we constantly are working in that Dr. Bugs is highlighting are facing decades of disinvestment and, uh, and over-policing. Um, and the men that we serve, uh, not only here in Chicago, but across, this, across other urban communities are also dealing with complex generational trauma from exposure to other violence. Uh, and on top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial reckoning that our country uh, seems to be um, encountering um, are just generations of grappling with some of the challenges that we've ha we've had in our communities, but also as a as a, as a nation, um, you know, I, I want to share something that's very personal for me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do this in a sense so it could help legitimize, so to speak, you know, the perspective that I'm sharing here today. Uh, I grew up in the southwest of Chicago, a community that's definitely has been plagued by its, its, its violence, but it's also a very promising and prosperous community as well. It's a community known as Little Village. And uh, first time that I was exposed to violence, I was, I was 13 years old. Uh, when I saw just a young man, uh, someone between the ages of 16 and 19 shot and killed just right in front of me as I was going to a local park to go play baseball. And that <clears throat> experience really um, kind of shaped the way that the trajectory in my own life. The following year, I joined a street gang. Uh, and then by the time I was 18 years old, I was in front of a judge being sentenced to 29 years for a first degree gang related murder. I ended up serving 14 years and three months. That's 5,200 days in prison. I served almost two years in segregation, uh, off and on three months here, six months there, and so on. And um, that perspective that I bring to this field is also informed and coupled by education, a master's degree at UFC, traveling through the State Department in various other countries, uh, Uganda, Spain, uh, Haiti, El Salvador, to talk about these very same issues that we're talking about today. And <clears throat> There are some common themes that I've seen across all these countries. And it really fundamentally goes with this question around what does real race and equity mean in our, in our country? Um, and how does that inform 
the things that we're grappling here today. Now, I could definitely go on with the achievements that I've had in my career, including as uh, as the mayor Fisher just mentioned just a moment ago, um, just delivering my my seventh child uh, just a few hours ago. But the truth is. I think about my children and I think about how privileged they are to be born to the parents they were born to. You know, my wife work, works for the Attorney General here in the state of Illinois. She's also a professor at UIC. Uh, and they're being raised in a very prominent, privileged community. Um, they have both their parents and they were very engaged in their lives, obviously. Um, but they didn't choose to the, the point, uh, they did not choose the parents to be born who they who they were born to, let alone the zip code they were born into. And that's fundamental. One of the things that I'm hoping to just leave here today, that many of the people that we're speaking about today never chose to be born into who they were born to or the communities they were born into. And yet within the context of those communities, they've had to make difficult decisions at times from very limited options. And I'll give you an example of what I'm referring to. Ready Chicago came, uh, it was birthed really out of the 2016 spike in violence that we saw in our city. What we saw were 750 homicides and several thousand shootings in our city. Nothing to be proud of. Last year, we had similar numbers. Now in 2016, philanthropy, government all came together to figure out what can we do differently that we haven't done in the past. And one of those things was Ready Chicago where we leveraged the best practices that we know about how jobs have actually helped reduce gun violence and how cognitive behavior therapy have also helped to reduce gun violence. And we infuse those things, but we also know that it wasn't enough. We knew that you needed housing, you needed family engagement, you needed individual mental therapy, um, and a number of other support services that are required. Now, at the end of the day, when you add those numbers, when you add the cost of that, most people would say it's pretty expensive. But according, and I'm so glad that every time is on this call as well, but according to a recent study they actually produced, um, on average, it is costing us in the billions, in the billions, uh, in terms of addressing the issue of gun violence. Whether it is hospitalization, the legal services, you know, the, the whole issues around um, the penal institutions and so on, uh, we are paying way too much as taxpayers. And let alone, you mentioned, you heard from Dr. Buzz talk about you know, for the first time ever, the federal government pushing $5 billion to support these issues of gun violence. Now, more that I could speak to that, you know, maybe hopefully through a Q&A, but at the end of the day, I wanna, I wanna provide a snapshot who it is that Dr. Bugs and I are speaking about. It's a population that is often overlooked. It is even a population that I would even make the argument that are marginalized, even within the marginalized communities that we're serving in. Our men in British Chicago have on average 17 or 18, 18 arrests they have five to six felony arrests. 60% of our men have been fa our fathers. So think about the opportunity to change the trajectory of many of these kids. 84% of our men have been victims, according to police and hospital data. This is not self-reporting, but according to concrete data, have been victims of violence. In fact, we think that number is much higher because many people who've been victims don't necessarily always go to, to institutions like the police or the hospital because of lack of trust. One third. 34% of our men in Red Chicago have been victims of gun violence. They are survivors of gun violence. I don't know, mayors, across this country, another program besides hospitals or programs that work with veterans that are serving uh, through a duration of services throughout the week, um, the amount of services that we provide for people who are survivors of gun violence. And that in itself poses so many challenges as well. 80% of our men are couch surfing, but by definition, 17% of them are actually don't have anywhere to live. Now, I could definitely go on with the stats that, that we're seeing within Ready, and I could tell you what works and what doesn't work. I could tell you that work, employment is a viable pathway for many of our folks, but that also means you have to invest in them, especially when the men in British Chicago have only completed a 10th grade level of education, but they're really truly reading at the sixth and seventh grade level. So as a city, we have failed them academically. We have also failed them to, to think about how we could include them in the workforce. There is no doubt why they feel excluded from all this because they have limited opportunities to help build their identity as well and formating you know, who, they believe, who they believe they are in these communities as well. I could tell you that right now we're seeing over 20% reduction of victimization in our program. 
We're also seeing over 70% reduction in terms of those who are in the treatment group versus the control group of our men being arrested for murder or attempt murder, over 70%. Now, I've neglected to mention that this program is being evaluated through the University of Chicago's Crime Lab. And it is unfortunate that we had to do an, a randomized controlled trial study to really make the argument that this population is really worth investing. And we're talking about 95% of our men in Red Chicago are African-American. These things that, are, that I'm mentioning right now uh, are key to creating a separate community um, that really at the end of the day lies within your investment. For those who are in this call, if you are saying that gun violence that public safety is a priority, then that should reflect in the budget that you actually have. And I learned that later on in my career by many people who are in the same positions that you are as well. Investing in community organizations and infrastructure is key. We too often have settled for standard, just basic care for our participants you know, and for our community. We need to elevate that standard. We also have to elevate you know, what I would grossly say um, is gun violence, an area that's been underdeveloped, underinvested, uh, and too stagnant. But that comes from government, not just philanthropy. And lastly, I'll give you a prime example. JP Morgan Chase Bank has been one of our fundamental partners behind this. Recently, we were awarded $2 million. And what I would want to highlight here is simply this, is that it takes to investment long term this is not a one or two year kind of charity approach. You need five to 10 years of strategy to really curb these issues of gun violence. And we do need police because they are part of the community. But we also need to think about this very differently. When in our city of Chicago, we're seeing that in police overtime, we're paying over $100 million. And then we're paying in court settlements nearly $100 million. We have to think about what else can we be investing to really curb those numbers as well. Again, as a person who comes from, from a military family and who comes from law enforcement, we need law enforcement, but we need to think about it very differently and it should reflect in our budgets. Thank you. I guess I'm right. up next, Mayor. Yeah, up next is Christopher Tuex from Christopher right. Tuex Game Changers here right. in Louisville. Chris? Mayor, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Turner and Mayor Schaff and, and Dr. Uh, Bugs and Eduardo. Just great commentary uh, already, especially from Dr. Bugs and, and Eduardo. Um, basically, uh, Mayor, you asked me to, to come on and, 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 and just kind of give a face a little bit to some of the victims uh, connected to so much reckless gunplay. And I, I do want to start out saying that for me, and I think for a lot of people, regardless of where you live at, if it doesn't sink in right now, that violence has become a public health crisis. And I don't really understand, you know, what people are, you know, drawing from so much devastation. And to what Eduardo was talking about as it relates to hospitals, uh, 20 years of my advocacy, 15 years of that has been spent closely with surgeons and nurses who constantly have to deal with ICU issues, constantly dealing with this trauma issue as far as reckless gunplay on the non-fatals and equally the non-fatals that turn the fatals at the hospital and trying to balance that between the other trauma deals they deal with with car wrecks, burns and everything that that entails. At the end of the day, I don't, uh, I haven't met a healthcare professional who really looks at this issue, who doesn't call this a public health crisis and should be treated as such. And with that said, the alarming thing that I think sometimes in these conversations that we don't look at as a clear evidence of a public health crisis is the non-fatal numbers. The non-fatal numbers of citizens getting wounded across this country is astronomical. And it's clear evidence of that. And then when we want to take it a little further about more evidence of a public health crisis on the human top, let's talk about the most littlest ones among us. I've talked to elementary school teachers who tell me now that we're almost losing kids. And this is hard to grasp at some level before they start K through 12. That means in preschool, 
that there's clear evidence of kids not even getting hit by bullets, except on rare occasions, that we have more evidence of kids who are being brought into this public health crisis as it relates to reckless gunplay and how they're mimicking these kind of negative behavioral uh, patterns and equally affected by the trauma of gunshots just going off in neighborhood and going through drills, get under the bed, get out of the window, where their life is not normal, there's no normalcy. And some of us, for some reason, after one shooting after another, we dismiss it and we think nobody got hurt, everybody's okay. They're not okay. So my plea in my little short time here, mayors and uh, distinguished panel and the audience out there is that we think more of this as a public health crisis, just like we rallied around how we would attack COVID-19 and other diseases. We should not feel in any kind of way that is hopeless to not attack this from a public health perspective. We don't have a cure for heart disease totally, or cancer totally. There's gonna be a lot of losses as it relates to these behavioral issues. But equally at the same time, the children deserve better in the sense of how we address this. And I would advocate for definitely more black mental health uh, professionals to jump in the rain and get funded for their work to deal with these issues because survivors, Mayor, to be quite frank with you, Mayor Spiritual, and you know how this goes, Greg, survivors are dealing with kind of dual issues. They deal with somebody in their family, family unfortunately being impacted by a reckless uh, uh, gun act. And equally at the same time, they have a family member who unfortunately gets sucked in to this vacuum, who's a perpetrator of this act. And they're trying to balance the whole idea of how they're dealing with this twofold chaotic situation in their households. And I would submit to everybody that, you know, uh, as far as Christopher 2X Game Changers, we sent out a little study in November of 19. This wasn't academic heavy, easy read. You all can access it, 2xgamechangers.org, and, our, and punch on our educate, uh, you know, section of, of the menu. And it talks about simply how kids, as it relates to violence, are impact, impacted in a way that it affects their learning curve. And this is real. I know that because this report was generated out of my grandchildren almost getting hit by AK-47 rounds while they were in a dwelling with their mother who's in early childhood uh, education as a teacher. And they were looking at a learning game on a monitor and at 3 p.m. in broad daylight, somebody was focusing on a target in the back of their townhouse and sprayed up three townhouses. And these kids barely uh, got out of harm's way. But if it wasn't for her quick thinking of pulling these kids under the bed and these kids at that time were one years of age, three years of age, five years of age, six years of age, and had two friends over at seven and six years of age. I can tell you all, quite frankly, that that experience still has effects as it relates to what happened in December of 18 to now, May of 2021. But where's the hope? And I'll wrap up on this. The hope is, is that we never give up. We don't surrender. We keep courageous hearts and we just started, and Greg, I, I've shared this with Mayor Fisher. We just started a hopeful um, and successful collaboration with medical students here in uh, the city of Louisville and also surgeons and nurses titled the Future Healers Program, where, and you all might see this on your camera. These are the images of young blacks that we hope to see here in the future. And I don't know if you all can see that picture or not, but this is what future healers look like, where we've got young individuals who are in scrubs with their stethoscopes around their neck to counter the negative images of young people who we think for some reason, or we'll think for some reason, haven't got a chance. We're gonna be 
growing this program as an example that there is hope, but we got to understand this is a long fight and it's not easy. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next up is the uh, mayor from the great city of Houston, the great mayor, Sylvester Turner. Thank you, thank you President Fisher. And let me just start off by um, thanking all of the other speakers, uh, Dr. Shana and Eduardo and Christopher 2X. And let me ditto everything that you said. I agree with everything that has, has been said. Uh, in December of 2018, uh, I assemble a group uh, to put, um, it was the Mayor's Commission on Gun Violence. And, uh, and Christopher 2X, one of the things, there were four things that they highlighted. Uh, one of the things was that we are dealing with a public health crisis. Yes, and sir. because there are victims all over the place. True. Even those who are doing the shooting are victims. Uh, and the victims are young and they are old and no one, quite frankly, until we grapple this issue in a comprehensive fashion, no one should deem themselves safe. I don't care if you live in an affluent community, uh, you shouldn't deem yourself safe. So we all have a vested interest in tackling, in tackling the subject. They focus on public health crisis, community safety, firearm safety and access, school safety. Those were the four major areas with the high emphasis on behavioral health as well. So um, let me just say from someone who, who grew up in the hood and someone as mayor of the fourth largest city who still lives in the hood, still live in that same neighborhood in which I was born and reared, uh, these issues are real and they are not, they are not new. Uh, Dr. Bugs, you talked about the fact that uh, we're dealing with issues that have been around for decades, and that is tr that is true. Uh, what COVID did uh, is that it pulled the cover uh, uh, and let us see very clearly issues that have been plaguing our cities for decades, communities that have been underlooked, underserved, under-resourced for decades. Uh, and therefore, a lot of these things have come to the surface. Um, let me just say, uh, in terms of what's happening in the city of Houston, and, and let me just focus on hom homicides, for example. In 2019, uh, President Fisher, in the city of Houston, we had 86, 86 homicides in 2019. In 2020, uh, the uh, year of COVID, that number went from 86 to 128, a 49% increase. And in 2021, as we stand right now, we have 166, uh, which is a 30% increase. So from 2019, 86, in all of 2019, and now in 2021, May, uh, 166, a 30% increase. Um, and you're wondering what's, what is, what is going, what's going on? What's happening here? Where in many ways, COVID has just um, exacerbated problems that were already beneath the surface. Um, and borne out by the commission that I did. When I came in as mayor in 2016, I said I didn't want to be the mayor of the city of Habit, have not. And so we started focusing on this initiative, what I call complete communities, uh, being very targeted, very intentional in, in investing in communities that have been underserved. And so the focus was on uh, business and job opportunities, affordable housing, uh, providing the infrastructure, healthcare needs, all in these communities, can do them all at the same time. So we initially selected five, and now we're up to 10. And it's not just for the city of Houston, but actually in the private sector and nonprofits and financial institutions, you name it, to come in and leverage their resources to bring about transformation in these underserved communities where there are a lot of shocks and stresses. And those elements still exist. COVID just exacerbated that. Um, and so uh, when it comes to the city, you know, what we're seeing areas, for example, family violence, gang activity, narcotics, drug sales, um, robberies, all of those things, that, you know, we're, we're, we're focusing on in a very intentional fashion. So let me tell you, in addition to what we're doing, uh, we are investing in communities that have been underserved. We're working directly with community groups. Okay. Uh, activists who are on the ground, who come from these neighborhoods, who are trusted voices in these neighborhoods, trying to get to them early, and they they become the extension, you know. Uh, so we invest in, in these community groups. We're working with the Houston Area Women's Center and others on domestic abuse, domestic violence, 
getting people out of dangerous situation, providing safe places, using some of our dollars, federal dollars that we receive and investing with, with some of these uh, community groups. Dr. Bugs, you talked about opportunity to use some of the dollars that we were receiving from the Biden-Harris administration on crisis intervention. We are taking at a minimum $25 million and putting it just on crisis intervention from some of these, do from some, uh, some of these dollars because the focus needs to be on addressing behavioral health issues, substance abuse issues, you know, getting the treatment that people need early on, uh, homelessness, okay? Um, and that's not including the dollars that we're using for domestic situations. Uh, but we are using some of those dollars because this is an opportunity, not just to be an incrementalist, but to be transformational, to kind of go directly to the heart. And the whole notion is, is that if we can read, if we can address some of these elements that are in with people in these communities, then you don't have to bring police in quite a bit. So it helps public safety overall, uh, but you're try, trying to get to the root causes. And then it, that's on that end. Education is always a critical component. That's, you know, you can't overlook that. So we have to invest in that and put people in a better opportunity. Um, and it's not just education, workforce development programs, critically important. You got to invest in our youth. When I came in, my summer youth program in 2016, there were 450. In 2019, we got it up to over 10,000 uh, kids, students, 16 to 24. Uh, we were supposed to get it up to 20,000 in 2020. COVID kind of worked against us. And now we're working that to get that back because our kids want to work. You know, they, they want to work uh, and you kind of go to have to go to where they are and then bring and then bring them in. And then we've instituted uh, this turnaround Houston program uh, for many of our adults. Um, they may have dropped out of school. They uh, they they don't know how to interview. Uh, they just may need to, uh, you know, they need the haircut. They need some clothing. But you want to do it in a very dignified way. And we go to the neighborhoods where they are and set up these programs. We don't even tell them that we've invited people to provide job opportunities to them, but there are jobs there because you don't want to bring them in and disappoint them. Uh, but we but we have jobs available for them and we go all over the community with those with those programs. My reentry program is one that I highlight very importantly because every single year we've got 13,000 people coming out of our correctional institutions coming back into our city and to our county and they need jobs and they need housing. And we have to focus on them and be very intentional. I go and speak to them and kind of and um, just let share with them um, my own experiences and why I chose to be mayor. But investing in in those in those communities, which is highly important. Um, in addition, yes, we do need law enforcement. We do have the overtime. But I agree with you, Eduardo. You know, you got to do those other things in order to bring down your overtime, or you can you you'll keep writing overtime, and you, you, it'll just keep going up and up and up and up and up, and the numbers will continue to go up and up and up, and it becomes highly frustrating. So you need a you need multiple strategies. It's not just one. So we do have overtime. Uh, we are working with all of our law enforcement partners to address it. We're using technology within our law enforcement officers, but I also have my law enforcement officers going into these communities, just like this past Saturday. It was our, um, um, our march for to end violence for peace, uh, where we were, had community activists and police officers walking together all together in the, in the community that George Floyd was, was reared in, uh, establishing those relationships. But you have to treat it as a public health crisis. You have to invest in communities that have been underserved. You have to do it before there's a flashpoint because you have to build that trust. And there's been a loss of trust and you don't rebuild it overnight. And quite frankly, as the mayor, it's important for me to be out there with them. And that's why I've, from, I've intentionally chosen to live in that neighborhood because you got to get a little street credit. And that gives you at least a some street credit, buys you some time where you've got gang members and others who are willing to call their mayor to kind of say, hey, you know, mayor, we'll work with you and all of that. Then lastly, on the state side, the state legislature, for example, have allowed too many guns on the street. Right now in the state of Texas, 
They are debating the bill that would allow people to carry guns without even getting a license. And that bill is moving through, okay? So the state criticizes gun, I mean, the, the violence, but they've created an atmosphere for the violence and they've made the guns accessible. And, you know, we have concealed carry. Now you're, the state of Texas is saying, you can carry a gun, you don't need a license, you don't need a permit, you don't need any training, just go and do it. And then you're criticizing when they're failing to invest in these communities and do the things that will ultimately make a difference. So we've got some issues here uh, that we have to work out and the violence that we are seeing in our cities to do on multiple levels. But lastly, it is a public health care crisis. If there are a lot of victims. And quite frankly, when, you, when people have ignored many of these communities for decades, at some point in time, it was bound to show up. And now we have to be intentional to reverse the course. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mayor Turner. Uh, I yield now. Great, now great, really great passionate time times. And uh, Mayor Schaff and Mayor Lucas, we got about 10 minutes and we got a wrap. So uh, uh, you don't have to be long to go strong. All right. Thank you, Mayor <laughs> Turner. Thank you, President Fisher. I love your compassionate leadership. Uh, when I was elected mayor of Oakland in 2014, my hometown had been in the top three most violent cities in America for as long as I could remember. And I ran on the promise that I would keep and scale a new strategy that Oakland had just begun implementing called ceasefire. Uh, and to Dr. Bugs's point, this was a strategy that our community demanded the city adopt. Now, Ceasefire uses the methods and strategies of disease control, which we've all become very familiar with over this last year. First, detect and interrupt the spread, and in the case of gun violence, that's conflicts. Uh, identify and treat those that are at highest risk, and then change social norms. So in Oakland, Ceasefire has five components. First, we start with expert analysis to identify who is at the highest risk of engaging in and or being a victim of gun violence. Uh, Christopher made the point earlier that it is often the same people. Uh, and as well as understanding the group or gang dynamics of violence, uh, especially group conflicts and retaliation risk that often drives up uh, the, the horrible toll. Second, we use direct and respectful communication with those at highest risks. We use group meetings or we call them call-ins where clergy, community members, and then last law enforcement all deliver the same message, which is we want you to live and be free. That message is amplified with faith leaders who lead peace walks through the most violence impacted neighborhoods along with our highly visible violence interrupters. We also communicate one-on-one -on -one immediately following shootings that have a high risk of retaliation. Uh, and we also go directly to shooting victims while they are still in their hospital beds. Uh, we have a deep partnership with our public hospital. And this moment of communication, not just with the victim, but with their loved ones who are full of emotions in that moment, uh, we have found to be extremely effective. Third, after asking people to put down their guns, we offer them relationship-based social services. Uh, we do that through life coaches and an array of nonprofit partnerships. And we communicate clearly that if these services are not taken up, if the harm and the violence does not stop, we will have to use law enforcement. We communicate that as a clear option, but an option of last resort. And that brings me to fourth, the ceasefire unit in our police department engages when our warnings and services have not worked. They use very focused operations that are intelligence driven and do not use aggressive tactics or broad sweeps. We acknowledge, but never celebrate arrests. Remember arrests are evidence of our failure 
to prevent the crime in the first place. And fifth and finally, all this is managed, coordinated and continually improved through a performance management system with the entire integrated CSPIRE partnership that I personally, as the mayor, run on a regular basis right at my conference room table, or at least these days through Zoom. In 2019, Oakland was recognized by the Gifford Center to Prevent Gun Violence in a national report that was called Oakland, a case study in hope. By then, Oakland was out of even the top 10 most violent cities. And in just five years after implementing ceasefire, we had cut gun violence in half and sustained it. Now, tragically, COVID-19 changed all that. Lockdown rules prevented ceasefire's critical communications, limited services, and changed our criminal court system such that the threat of enforcement became hollow. And ceasefire's dependence on increasing the legitimacy of laws and law enforcement was eviscerated by the brutal police murder of George Floyd. It's very important we recognize the impact of that and similar uh, perversions of justice in our gun violence efforts. I am devastated to report that year to date, homicides and shootings in Oakland have increased 109% compared to this time just two years ago in 2019 when we were celebrating that national report. And in addition to lockdown restrictions, the proliferation of more powerful automatic weapons on our streets and a brazen willingness to shoot round after round is a change that we have seen in this last difficult year. Now we must restrict these weapons of war. They have no place in our communities and stop their illegal trafficking into jurisdictions like California where they are banned but they are being used nonetheless. We are also seeing untreated mental illness and addiction play an increased role in violence in this last horrible year. 18% of Oakland's 2020 homicides occurred in homeless encampments. This country must start taking mental health more seriously. Now, Oakland will re-engage uh, the focused deterrence approach of ceasefire as conditions are beginning to allow us to. And we will also work to expand our public health approach to more upstream prevention work. As my chief of violence prevention, Guillermo Cespedes says, we must do more fireproofing to prevent tomorrow's fires at the same time that we are putting out the fires we have right now. We know that ACEs or childhood traumas cause toxic stress that affect brain development, impulse control, and decision-making. And if we can prevent or heal ACEs, we won't have as many adults that are at high risk for violence. I look forward to working with the US Conference to not only stop the bleeding of today's gun violence epidemic, but also invest even more in preventing it. So now it's my pleasure to pass the Zoom to Mayor Quinton Lucas of Kansas City, Missouri. To you, Mayor Lucas. Thank you, Mayor Schaff. Mayor Fisher runs a tight ship and he told me that we have to be done at uh, 10 minutes before the hour. So I will be the fastest. I'm also comparatively the rookie. Mayor Turner, Mayor Schaff, Mayor Fisher have been at this for a while. So I will just in some ways leave us with the magnitude of the problem. I am uh, one of the younger mayors Kansas City's ever had. So I asked my staff the other day to calculate how many people have been murdered in my lifetime, about 37 years. The answer is 4,466. War-like numbers. War-like numbers that show the same old investments haven't worked. We have increased police budgets year after year. We have looked to an enforcement tack year after year. The very things that we've heard today are much of what we're working on in Kansas City. I'll add just two more steps for us. 
one of which is to get the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives to work on truly enforcing how guns are getting into cities like Oakland, Houston, and Kansas City, to make sure that they're actually using their investigative tactics, particularly when we're visiting with a new administration, to make sure we're trying to shut down illegal gun dealers, trying to make sure that we're not seeing those loopholes in the sales of gun shows that often happen in areas hours from our cities, but help lead to the carnage that we see on our streets. Another thing that has been so important for us is actually making sure that we are looking at that prevention and intervention side. You've heard both mayors mention that already. One thing we might add is on the re-entry side, making sure that as we're looking at folks who are returning citizens to our community, they have hope and they have opportunities. There is much more that we need to do there to make sure we are breaking that cycle. It is too predictable now, sometimes when we see the homicides on our streets, that you know that if somebody got killed in this incident, the repercussions later will be a brother, a cousin, a sister, an associate. We can break those cycles. That's what you're seeing in a lot of these cure violence models, and we need more investment from there. But I, I will leave with this challenge. Right now, our police department and the police chief, I, I don't get to appoint any of these folks, have a blog out right now on how they need more money for more officers, for more things, for more solutions. And that alone is the solution. The public is somewhat confused now. And that's why I really appreciate the presentations I saw, because we have to keep making clear that these programs work that while it may seem easy to use a 1985, 1995 solution to these sorts of things, there are new ways to do it. There are cities where it has been effective and that we have to truly believe that the Oakland solution, for example, is one that can work in a Kansas City or in a Houston or the Houston solution and model of some that you can use in the Bay Area. That's the sort of work that we're doing and that's why I commend the conference for being here today. I'm, I'm sure we will share more in future meetings, Mayor Fisher, but I wanted to uh, make sure at least we got that step in and actually just showing the need for change. I don't want 5,000 more people murdered on the streets, mainly with firearms in Kansas City over the next year. And that's in so many American cities. And I think mayors working together can make that difference. Thank you, Mayor Lucas, uh, for a strong uh, close there. So just want to thank everybody. So what we're talking about here, folks, when we talk about this conference, reimagining public safety, you've just heard multiple good examples of that. Too often our citizens just think about police. Clearly that's not working. And yes, we need good constitutional, equitable, compassionate policing in our city, but we need all of the other wraparounds around that as well, from community mobilization, intervention, prevention, reentry. And so the purpose of this session was to see those ideas for you. Unfortunately, it ran a little long, so we don't have time for questions. Uh, we do have plenty of resources at the usmayors.org website as well. So I want to thank all of our speakers for joining us here today, in particular on our non-mayors, Dr. Bugs, uh, Eddie, and congratulations again on child number seven, uh, Christopher 2X here uh, to help the mayors of America think more broadly as we go about this combined mission of safer cities. So with that, folks, we'll be taking a break to 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be starting our next session. Thanks very much.
Laura. Carol Mason is having trouble trying to get in. Yeah, you're muted, Laura. Hey, Anthony. Hey, Mayor. We're checking on that now, Anthony. Thank you. Michael and Marcus, thank you for joining us here today. Absolutely, Mayor, glad to be here. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we had a good first session. I don't know if you saw that or not. It really warmed us up in a good way. Free Dr. Bugs and Chico, not Chico, Eddie, and the crew laid it down, so it was good. Yeah. Now, Anthony, your job is just to give us the solutions, man. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I think that's how we build this one. <laughs> that's hey, it. guys, just a, quick, just a quick reminder that we're still live on YouTube. We don't enter and exit a green room, so just want to play. It, it's all good, okay. man. <laughs> Great. Just wanted to make sure everyone... All right, give, just let so us know when... It, yeah, I'd say it's two o'clock, so uh, we're working on okay. getting our last speaker up. But if you want to go ahead, we can. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. We appreciate you joining us. In this session, we're going to be talking about reimagining public safety by adopting a whole of government and whole of city approach. So this very much means, you know, it, it's not just the police. Again, that's what everybody, most everybody thinks about. That's a, a small part of this total equation. So when you think about whole of city and the needing, need to adopt this approach, a, a recent Washington Post editorial really spoke to me. Here's what it said. We should think about public safety the way we think about public health. And just like health isn't just about hospitals, safety is not just about police. So to create safer cities, as mayors, we need to recognize that multiple city agencies have a role to play as do business and community partners. There's also a hospital analogy and that oftentimes in us combating gun violence and homicides, people are like, you know, what's left to do? We've tried everything. Well, think about the hospital. There's a lot of people that die when they go to hospitals. Okay, but we don't shut down hospitals or we don't give up on research. We don't give up on teamwork. And that's the same analogy I'd like to draw here with fighting gun violence and homicides. It's just, it's hard work and we gotta stick with it. So we gotta think about our response to all these issues uh, that arise from homelessness, mental health crisis, adverse childhood experiences, domestic violence, as we work to create more pathways for opportunity, especially for our youth. So too many have just grown hopeless about their futures. So to moderate this session is the head of an organization that's a fantastic partner to the United States Conference of Mayors in our cities. And when we were planning this summit, we knew that we needed a partner to help us broaden our perspective on the many factors that lead to gun violence as we work together to create solutions. Uh, Cities United was the natural choice to join forces uh, with us because of their work to reduce the unacceptable epidemic of homicides and shootings among young black men and boys ages 14 to 24. I've been a big admirer of their work and I'm pleased to welcome the executive director of Cities United, a fellow proud Louisvillian as well, and that would be their director and CEO, Anthony Smith. Anthony, take it away. Yes, thank you, Mayor Fisher. And I wanna thank the US Conference of Mayors in every town for really elevating this important conversation in our, in our country. Uh, Cities United was founded 10 years ago by the former Mayor Nutter and Mayor Landrews uh, when they partnered with Dr. Bell from the Casey Family Programs uh, Sean Dove, formerly with the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, and the National League of Cities at a time, and, and as you heard Dr. Bug said, we've been at a crisis. Uh, the issue that Mayor Nutter and Mayor uh, uh, Landrew came together around was they were sending too many young Black folks, young Black men dying in the streets of their community uh, and did not have a lot of solutions and was not having a national conversation about what we were going to do as a country, not only what we do as a city, but this was a national uh, public health crisis, as you've heard folks talk about. So they pulled folks together and really said, what is it that we can do and what do we need to be doing collectively as mayors, even though we're dealing with a national public health crisis, it happens in cities. Uh, and mayors need tools, they need resources, and they need ways to really address this holistically. 
uh, and not just with the hammer that we've been doing with police law uh, with law enforcement it's not the way that's not the way that's going to get us out of this and get us to the path where we're truly are talking about public safety uh, so Cities United has been working in partnership with mayors, community members, and young leaders all across the country, really saying, how do we reimagine public safety? How do we uh, really interrupt the cycle of violence that our communities are dealing with? And we know there's proven ways, and you heard folks talk about those uh, earlier, right? When you think about community intervention uh, and prevention strategies that we know that work when you have trusted, uh, credible messengers who can get in the streets and really talk and partly talk and partner not only to squash the beast, but also to connect young people to real resources that could really help them get to a different place and to a different uh, outcomes. But we also just got to really address and uh, Mayor Shaft opened it up uh, last conversation uh, around we got to think about the racial equity and we've got to think about how all of this cycle is created through institutional racism and perpetrated and we got to address that head on. We cannot run away from that conversation. We really got to own up to it and understand that police violence is a part of gun violence. And when we have incidents, uh, not just like George Floyd, but Breonna Taylor, uh, Anthony Thompson Jr., Tony McDade, and I can go on and on and on, Tamir Rice. These are issues that we've got to understand and address that actually create and, 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 and influence the, the cycle of community violence that we see happening every day. So one, we've got to invest in those things that work to disrupt the cycle of violence that our young folks are dealing with and our communities are dealing with. And then two, we've got to, and mayors and, and other elected officials have a unique position where we can put together policies and procedures to really dismantle the, uh, the systems of inequity that we have been dealing with for 400 years and for generations. But then two, we've got to invest in what we know work. We've got to invest in new models. We've got to create new spaces uh, that, that really create true public safety because public safety is not just around white folks feeling safe, public safety is around all of us feeling safe. And our current model really is around making sure that the majority feels safe uh, in this issue and the other folks are detained and controlled. So we really got to think about how we show up and reimagining public safety means we got to mayor's point, bring the whole of the city into this conversation. We can no longer rely on the old models of public safety as a way to get us to uh, true peace. Uh, you heard Dr. Bugs also talk about fund peace and the campaign that's there. Uh, the president, our current administration has made it clear that uh, community violence and community violence, uh, addressing community violence in the way that we're talking about today is where they're gonna invest their dollars. They're gonna be investing their dollars in community-based organizations and communities that are really looking at alternatives and really saying, let's use the models that we know work and let's invest in those models and let's invest in those folks who run those models so that we can get them to the, uh, capacity that they need to really address this public health crisis that we're dealing with. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to talk about, a lot of things that we need to move on, but to really reimagine public safety and redefine public safety means that we as cities and as countries got to reallocate our resources in a way that now supports a, a new a new model of public safety. So to help, help kind of really lay this conversation out, we have some amazing folks with us. Uh, we have a uh, Michael Sean Spence, who's the Director of Community Safety Initiatives with Every Town uh, for Gun Safety. We have Marcus Ellis, who's the Chief of Staff for Safer, Stronger uh, DC Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement uh, uh, for Mayor uh, Bowser out of DC. And we also have our friend, Carol Mason, who's the President of John Jay College of Criminology, uh, Criminal Justice. Uh, we also have Mayor Tom, uh, Tim Keller, who's going to be joining us, uh, Mayor of, of Albuquerque, who's going to be a part of this conversation. So you'll hear them in that order. Uh, so I'm excited to really uh, have this conversation and hopefully we can have time to really dive in. But I just really want to make sure that we leave on understanding that uh, we are dealing with a public health crisis that really needs investment now and needs us to act differently than we ever have before. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael Sean Spence uh, to share his remarks. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, it's an honor to join you, this distinguished panel, this phenomenal group of mayors and practitioners to discuss a comprehensive whole of city approach to city gun violence prevention. In light of the persistent gun violence impacting cities nationwide, this summit and our conversation couldn't be more timely, particularly as the incredibly effective community led efforts, which have been happening on the front lines of violence prevention for decades, begin to receive the acknowledgement and support they deserve. 
But first, it's important we revisit our why. And I know we had a, a earlier panel where we discussed some of this, but specifically why we at every town advocate for and why many of you have already adopted community-based efforts to implement evidence-based violence intervention programs as a core component of your city's comprehensive approach to violence reduction. First, as was noted by Anthony, gun-related homicides are concentrated in American cities, with more than 50% of gun homicides occurring in just 127, and one, of out, out, one out of every three occurring in just 50. Secondly, even within these cities, violence is further concentrated into pockets of gross inequity, primarily within black and brown communities, which bear the brunt of the gun-related homicides, non-fatal shootings, and the ensuing trauma. And furthermore, within these neighborhoods, the violence is even further concentrated into the social networks that drive the violence, which research has found can re represent as little as one to three percent of your total population, affirming what many of us already know, that the vast majority of the individuals who live in black and brown communities want safety and they want the violence to stop. And furthermore, there are community members and community-based organizations in these same neighborhoods invested in ensuring public safety for their neighbors who have the trust and legitimacy needed to identify and engage individuals at risk of shooting or being shot to prevent the next shooting and stop retaliation. And fortunately, there are community-led efforts that leverage these organizations' unique station at the intersection of community and public safety to implement strategies that employ, as Anthony mentioned, a public health approach and effectively engage the people and the places that drive the majority of your city's gun violence. Strategies like street outreach, which employ violence interrupters to directly engage at-risk individuals and has reduced shooting victimizations by as much as 63% in the Bronx, two miles away from where I am currently in Harlem. Group violence interventions, a collaborative effort between law enforcement and community leaders to engage those at the highest risk with the promise of heightened enforcement and expedited social service support, which saw a 37% reduction in gun homicides in Chicago during implementation in their core sites. Hospital-based violence intervention programs, which leverage the unique window when a survivor enters a hospital with a non-fatal shooting and is willing to share their experience with gun violence as well as receive services which has seen re-injury rates for survivors slashed by almost half in San Francisco and by two thirds in Indianapolis while also achieving cost savings, as well as emerging strategies that show promise like youth focused trauma services that provide a necessary outlet for youth who have been impacted by gun violence to interrupt the cycle of violence. But more importantly, community members and city leaders around the country have told us loud and clear that these strategies are not only effective but are also best implemented as a component of a resourced, hyper-local, comprehensive, whole of city strategy that targets, as I mentioned earlier, the people and the places that drive the majority of your gun violence while centering the needs of those living in the communities facing concentrated harm. For this reason, every town has prioritized elevating community leaders through our legislative advocacy and VOCA advocacy recently releasing two reports with Cities United detailing the incredible resource Victim of Crime Act funding is, while also providing direct support to community-based violence intervention programs, granting 3.7 million to 60 groups in 35 cities since 2018. But of course, our support pales in comparison to the capacity of the federal government, hence our collective excitement about President Biden affirming the value of this work by signing the American Rescue Plan, which provides $130 billion in support to states and localities, and providing explicit guidance that 26 current grant programs across five federal agencies can and should be used to support violence intervention work in cities nationwide. So this is truly a unique moment for this movement, and one that provides exciting opportunities to sustain and bolster the violence reduction efforts that community members have un undertaken for decades, frequently without the necessary resources. But as Anthony also mentioned in the beginning, community leaders have also shared that there's still more we can and need to do. At the local level, cities have a huge role to play in coordinating a cross section of municipal agencies who can leverage their unique intervention points to identify and engage those at risk of shooting and being shot, as well as supplementing law enforcement and community led efforts to connect at risk individuals to the supports and services we know can ensure their progress. And as many of you have already been, cities should also be innovative, exploring new strategies and tailoring them for their community 
And I'd encourage cities to explore citygrip.org. That's C-I-T-Y-G-R-I-P.org. Every town's online clearinghouse of emerging and evidence-based gun violence reduction strategies. With the emerging opportunities we're now grappling with, it's critical for cities to learn what strategies have worked to reduce violence in other cities and for them to hear how other community leaders have already implemented these strategies. And that's why I'm thrilled to be joined by our next speaker, my friend Marcus Ellis, Chief of Staff with the DC Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. DC's efforts are an encouraging example of how a local government can engage with their community at the same table to develop solutions and strategies in coalition. Just last week, in partnership with LISC, every town convened a community training session attended by DC Public Schools, DC Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, and 10 local organizations in DC alongside Moms Demand Action volunteers to discuss our common goal of collaborating to reduce gun violence in the district. This training was just one example of DC's continued efforts to center the needs of their community and to fuel a whole of city approach to develop and implement a collaborative effort that reaches across government and community. Now I'd like to turn it to Marcus to speak on his office's mission and incredible core programming efforts. Marcus. All right, well, first of all, let me say thank you. Um, thank you to you and your team for all the work that you all are doing. It's a pleasure to be a part of this panel. Um, Anthony, when you introduced me, I wanna add a title that's just as important to me and that is board member with Cities United. Um, I am ecstatic to be a part of an amazing team doing amazing work across the country. Um, just to highlight a few points here, um, back in 2016 was when the bell kind of really rung for DC in terms of the way we needed to change the way we were doing our work. It was at that point where I was introduced to Cities United and we were talking about different strategies and ways to, to really address this problem. Um, Fortunately for us during that time, there was legislation being put out by our city council, the NEAR Act, Neighborhood Engagement Achieved Results. And I wanna start with that point because legislation is such a huge part of the conversation we're having. Um, I think without it, we come up with programs. We come up with programs that last for a certain amount of time. But when you put something in the legislation, it circumvents and lasts out, it lasts out mayor terms, it lasts out you know, people and ideas because it's a legislation that can hold for years to come. And I think that's an important part of the work we do. Um, you know, after that legislation came, our mayor moved forward and supported this uh, proposal by our city council and added a budget to that legislation. So two key things, we got legislation from the council and we had budget uh, support and approval from the mayor. Uh, to, I think that, that when we talk about it, at least from a government lens, those two entities working together uh, is what really helped us to arrive to where we are right now. And then we needed a plan. We needed to figure out what exactly we wanted to do as we worked to put together this non-policing approach to reducing violence in our city. With that, you know, the NERAC asked us to, to uh, prioritize 50 individuals in our city that were either the victims of or involved in gun violence. And that's what the, the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement set out to do. We designed something we call the Pathways Program. And that Pathways Program was, uh, uh, was designed not to just address the individuals that I mentioned in that portfolio, but to, to provide supports for their family and to, to be very, very strategic about not taking a cookie cutter approach with the way that we serve them. Um, along with serving them, we understood that for us to implement a program of this type, we were gonna to have to make sure that folks were okay. How were they gonna buy into a program that was really about changing their mindset and where their life was headed without having food on their tables, without having other lights on in their homes and things of that nature. And so for that reason, a collective effort was made within government through our Department of Employment Services to provide these young, to provide these men with a site. And therefore they could come in and they could be a part of a program, again, designed not to just change their lives and the trajectory of their lives, but also to take care of their families at the same time. Over recent years, um, when I speak about our budget, when we first started out with our office, we were housing three core programs. Pathways program that I just mentioned, our on the ground violence intervention and prevention efforts in 21 priority communities. And we had something we called family survivor support. This uh, was a program that, that um, uniquely 
touch families after acts of gun violence to provide wraparound services to the families. Those were the three programs back in 2016, and we were at $2.6 million as a budget. Um, you know, for this to be the first office of this sort in D.C., we were happy with that funding, but we quickly, we quickly realized, and so did our mayor, that it was going to take more of an investment. At this point, I'm happy to say four years later, four or five years later, we are now at headed toward a budget of approximately $14 million. Our programs have grown from three programs to now seven different entities that are all based around addressing um, violence reduction in the district. And, and then we kind of, we took all of this and, and that level of investment and for lack of better terms, we put it on steroids. I think that we talked about this before. There's so many different entities working in, uh, in siloed approaches in, in all of our cities. I don't think this is unique to DC. And therefore we, we started what we call Building Blocks DC. Building Blocks DC is a $15 million investment by our mayor outside of the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, and that being Mayor Bowser, that has brought every entity in the District of Columbia into the conversation around violence prevention. It's now focused on making sure that the Department of Employment Services, the, the, the DMV, rec centers, everyone knows now that you are a part of the answer. When we got a, a, a young man who was struggling to get a job because he can't get his identification card, guess what, DMV? You're a part of this as well. Um, when we, we, we bring all these housing uh, uh, situations together to make sure that the housing authority is now understood that it's going to be important that we provide safe housing. Uh, we look at our public school systems to make sure that they, they understand that we're going to have folks coming to our schools with issues that are surrounded by violence. How are you a part of the solution? And so this is the newest investment of, of Mayor Bowser here in D.C. Um, we are still in the beginning processes of this. And, and what we really feel like is that even when WANS, the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, was created, we still somewhat felt like we were on an island trying to pull everybody else into this conversation. And so, you know, one of the things that I would leave in, in, in terms of strategic planning and as we look, afford, look, uh, look ahead across across the US is that we gotta make sure that everyone's at the table. And not just a government effort, but community efforts as well, making sure that everyone is a part of the conversation. And so with that, I wanna pause and I wanna make sure that I, um, I pass, the, um, pass the virtual mic <laughs> to Carol Mason, who is um, doing great work and, and um, we're looking forward to hearing more about the work that you're doing as well, so thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm furiously writing notes. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I process by taking notes. And uh, you will hear from me again, both of you, because I, I need you in this work with, um, with us, because this is the only way we're going to get there. So um, you've heard Michael Sean Spence and Marcus Ellis talk about specifics of what they've been doing. I'm going to take us a step back again and, and help you um, Think about this in a way that I hope stays with you forever. And by you, I mean the mayors and your teams in doing this work. So last night I watched the um, CNN special on Marvin Gaye's the 50th anniversary of what's going on. And if you haven't watched it, I recommend that you watch it for a couple of reasons, not for the, not for the music, the music is beautiful, but for the reminder of what happens if we don't get it right. Because 50 years ago, Marvin Gaye talked about exactly what's happening today. 50 years ago in, in Detroit, seeing what was happening in his community and he was so moved by it, he wrote the, the whole, what's going on. And when you see the images in the CNN special about how communities of color, impoverished communities and their relationship with police it's, it's as if they had body cameras back then, but they didn't. And so here we are 50 years later, dealing with the same situation. And I don't know about you, but I, I, am, I don't have another 50 years in me to repeat this cycle. And I don't want Michael Sean Spence and Marcus Ellis to be the Carol Masons or the Greg Fishers or the Anthony Smiths or the Tom Cochran's I can't see your face, Mayor Keller, so I don't know how old you are, or the Laura Waxmans in our shoes, again, telling the young people who are like Marcus and Michael, we didn't get it right 50 years ago. 
because we're going to get it right this time. And what that means is, 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 you know, in the wake of this pandemic that has killed almost 600,000 people from COVID, it tore the veil off the inequities in our system, in our country, from health, education, jobs, because the most vulnerable were the ones dying from COVID. Then George Floyd, for those who didn't have the veil torn off already, really tore off the veil of inequities in our, in our criminal justice system. And so we have got to face the fact that, that, that we are in the middle of a crisis, but the opposite of a crisis is an opportunity. And we have a major opportunity. We have 130 billion that are going to state and local governments. That's not including the money that's going to uh, K through 12 and higher ed. That's not including other money coming into our communities. The question is, how are we going to be strategic about it and use this opportunity and use this funding not to put band-aids on situations, not to put band-aids on problems, but really make some systemic changes, long-term systemic changes in how we operate. And for those of you mayors who are watching, I am challenging you to really think about what role you want to play and what role you want to go down in history as having played in making this systemic change. And that means that your successors may get the credit for what you do today. And that's okay, because it will still be recorded that the work started with you. And it's important that you realize that this work, you've heard it said already, it's long, hard, deep work that's going to outlive election cycles but I hope be done within a time period so that Michael, Sean and Marcus can sit and talk to a new generation of leaders about how they made this change and how we achieve this systemic change. And what is it that we're trying to do? You've heard it said already, we all want communities that we wanna live in. We want opportunities for all of our children, the same opportunities you want for your children. You want them to go to school or have options to go to college, build careers, build lives. And that's why I loved, Michael, that, that um, Marcus, you described it as the building blocks of DC. Terminology is important. So 50 years ago, they tried to approach this with a war on poverty and a war on crime. This is not a war. This is about relationship building. This is about building trust, building communities. And we've got to speak it the way we want to see it evolve. And I love the approaches. So, so I had the uh, benefit of being the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs four years ago and uh, watched the birth of Cities United. I'm, I'm laughing because uh, Mayor Nutter, Mayor Landrieu were, were, were not subtle in what they wanted and their vision. Uh, uh, we all shared a vision. I, I was trying to uh, push our, our uh, focus on youth violence prevention, and it wasn't an either or to me. And that's the thing the mayors need to hear. None of this is an either or, it's an all and. Everybody needs to be at the table working at this. And what you need to do is do your homework. And, and not necessarily you personally, though it'd be nice, but your teams ought to do the homework. And so I've got some homework for you. Anthony put it in the chat. He didn't know I was gonna have props. This report, read it. Do it online because there are links online, but I like paper. I'm old fashioned. John Jay put together a report called The Future of Public Safety. You can Google it and find it. What, so what happened is that when I was the Assistant Attorney General, we funded a program called Bu Building Community Trust and Justice because what we wanted to do was we know that, that if we don't have community trust in our systems, we don't have successful systems. And we started with police because that was just a starting point, but I'm blowing that up now. We've got to use different terminology, changing that. We need a different starting place today. And the starting place is how do you, how do you bring all the voices together to the table? I love the way that Michael, Sean and Marcus talked about bringing everybody to the table with a real voice 
and a real opportunity to commit to the conversation. The third thing I recommended you read is go find the Washington Post series on reimagining public safety. You got to read that one online because the links will take you down a lot of different rabbit holes. It's fascinating, good work. The point of all this there is that you don't need to recreate the wheel. The research has already been done. We know what will work in communities and we need a continuum of engagement. We need investment in our schools. We need an investment in job creation. We need an investment in housing, good quality, safe housing. We need an investment in mental health and healthcare. Um, we need to, to figure out how those who are uh, most at risk of getting caught up in violence that we support them and support their success. And I love how in DC they've institutionalized it because that's what's critical. We need to make this money long-term sustainable not something that we just fund today because we've got a problem today. It's, it's going to take a good 10 years for us to have real, sustainable, systematic change in our systems, in our country. And so you need to invest in these, these um, individuals who are doing this work the same way you invest in law enforcement. It's a profession. It's a career. It ought to, they ought to be getting uh, more than livable wages. If you really invested in community safety, you need to invest in the community to get there. And so if we could get, the, the, the origin of this report is, um, I'll give you the shorthand version. Minneapolis was one of our pilot sites. They had racial reconciliation training, every sworn and civilian officer. They had implicit bias training. They did racial reconciliation and yet George Floyd still happened. And we invested in this work trying to keep a Michael Brown situation from never happening again. So as you know, the conversation is now polarized police or not police, abolish the police. What do you do about police? Wrong conversation. Conversation ought to be how are we investing in our communities to make them safer? And I use the word public safety, but because of talking with some folks in San Jose, I'm going to change my terminology to community safety because that's the change in phraseology. Words are important so that everybody understands we all have a role in this. We all own this. It's not the province of police to create safe communities. And so we brought together all different kinds of voices for a series of six conversations and devoted one conversation to public health professionals. And when you look at this, you'll see a whole, um, everybody that participated in the conversations. And we came away with nine points of consensus. And the point of that is, is that if you engage your community, you find common ground and you can avoid the conversations that, that polarize you and focus on what, 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 what binds you, what builds you together. And so what I hope that you hear from this is, is that the great work that every town is doing, and I remember having meetings with them when I was at OJP, and it is music to my ears that you understand the money that's available through VOCA and use it. Um, and it is music to my ears to hear that, that DC is legislating this work. We need to legislate it beyond just the city level so that people understand that, that, that we're committed to their success. So I could keep preaching, but I won't because I think I'm already talking to the converted. But here's the final, my final comment before Anthony opens this up. Words are not enough. The people who are out there protesting need to see action. They, in order for them to know that you've heard them, they need to see you doing something tangible. And so my students at John Jay, where we're educating future law enforcement officers that are going to go across the country and will not be like what happened with George Floyd. I don't like to say that officer's name. He's not even an officer anymore. I don't like to say his name, but we will, we will have officers coming out of John Jay who are committed to community relationships, not just partnership, relationships. And they challenged, our students challenged me to, to create a more um, um, culturally aware anti-racist curriculum. They protested, they pushed, and we did it. We got consensus. We are revamping our curriculum. That's what we're doing. Question is, what are you doing that people can see in a tangible way that you're hearing them, you're, you're, you're listening to what they want, and you're investing in their success. That's what I hope that you come away doing as a result of this conversation today. So Thank Anthony, I'll give it, I give it back to Mayor Tim Keller, don't I? Thank From you. From Albuquerque, yes. and I have been to your fair city a number of times, 
working on tribal issues and, and, and I hope the same applies to your relationships and partnerships with, with all communities within your boundaries. So Mayor Keller. Thank you so much. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> Carol, just reflecting on some of your, uh, your remarks, I, I can't help but think as I look at this panel, it was two years ago uh, around this time when I did two things. Uh, I met Anthony, uh, it was at a conference in DC. And, and then I also made, right after that, I went to my first trip to the, the John Jay School. And uh, who would have thought that those two interactions would have been uh, so empowering for, for myself personally, but also for the city of Albuquerque. And so, you know, uh, I would just, I think also mention, I'm, I'm feverishly writing things down too. And like, you know, all I want now is more time with everyone on the panel and others on this. So uh, I'll share kind of what we're up to, but uh, just want to thank everyone for what they've shared and uh, encourage other mayors to certainly uh, listen and take action. So a couple of things that I would share, you know, thanks to the, the inspiration of, uh, of uh, John Jay and Anthony, we are now full bore on the, the we're part of the, the safe cities uh, communities with John Jay and so forth. And I think for mayors and others watching, if you're not familiar with this, there are a lot of programs with uh, different, uh, you know, important components, but I want to try and really just distill these a little bit just for the audience, not the panelists, but just for others who are listening, but uh, in, in a backwards way. So two days ago, uh, I was with our violence intervention team, a social worker, a former felon, uh, a couple of law enforcement officers, and we were literally doing home visits uh, to multiple uh, uh, felon violent criminals. And I always ask like, why, why on earth should the mayor ever be involved in this? Because I feel like politicians just mess it up. But as, as you know, from the academia on this, the mayor is just there for kind of shock value to get people to listen. But I'm letting you know that some of this is personal, like, like literally, I spend a day doing that. And I do that almost every other month with our team. And it's extremely powerful for me just to understand the situation that some of these individuals are in, whether it's the family situation and they're just trying to actually help their kids or they're trying to uh, deal with a home situation where they're trying to get out of the house and they're trying to sort of set up a life for their own, but all the ways the system has failed them along that path. And then for us to come and say, and I literally apologize for our city, right? I say, on behalf of the city, I want to apologize for letting you down. And then I say that this team that is here today will not let you down. We will get you housing help. We will get you uh, help with your children. Uh, we will get you addiction help. And we will try and keep you safe, right? The actual individual who is a violent criminal. That's the kind of powerful message that I think is very important and I think is really behind a lot of the academia. And I just wanted to share that story because I would not be personally doing this at all if I hadn't met the two of you. Well, at John Jay School, I meeting <laughs> since I, Carol, we haven't met, but uh, in Anthony, so, <clears throat> That's one program we're doing and uh, we're late to it. A lot of cities are doing it. So I'm just grateful for able to get it up and running and we were able to do it during the pandemic. But I wanna share with you today a little bit about something that is transforming the way we handle community safety in Albuquerque. And we uh, had been piloting before the pandemic and before what happened with George Floyd, this concept of trying to have a public health response but through the 911 system. So this would be for a situation of an individual where they might be having a behavioral health situation, a mental health situation, or even more of a, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, children, youth, and families, uh, you know, situation with uh, negligence with children and these kinds of things, or even abandoned cars, or even down and outs in our unsheltered community. And we piloted having the fire department take these calls, EMTs instead of police. And what we found is that, you know, we were taking 6,000 people a year uh, to the emergency room, but only 3% of them actually needed care. We just had, we didn't know what else to do with them, right? And uh, then we also found that in total, there are about 15,000 calls into our 911 system that essentially like it had nothing to do with a, um, a police response, like they just didn't need that straight up. So it was also creating, you know, a long response time in our 911 system. So we were kind of toying with this. And then, you know, I'll tell you frankly what happened 
is uh, we had this idea to create a new response to 911. So when you call, right, 911, you get police or you get fire. And uh, at least our theory in our town is that that's not adequate anymore, right? That we've been doing that for a long time. And at least in Albuquerque, we need a third response that is the right response at the right time. And it's, it's also someone without a weapon, uh, right? And just symbolically and also in reality because of escalation. It's also a trained social worker who understands how to deal with these situations and can provide services, but can also take someone somewhere like in the example of a mental health issue or behavioral health issue, I can take you somewhere besides the ER uh, and connect you with those services. So we've uh, decided to create a new department. It is a cabinet level department. It is woven into our 911 system. Uh, it's called the Albuquerque Community Safety Department. I appreciate the, the vocabulary nod there. So we, we, do, we spent a long time on the name and that's where we landed, but uh, it's about the right response at the right time. And the idea is that you know, these folks uh, literally show up in the same way. So when the call comes in and we don't wanna put the burden on the individual to say like, well, I need an EMT or I need a police, right? We don't do that, right? Dispatch sorts them. And now dispatch will sort uh, out to this community safety department, which, which will operate, of course, 24 seven as part of our city's emergency response. So it's a full cabinet level certified uh, department and so forth. And the uh, where we're at right now, I'll kind of end with that. But I, I do want to mention there's an amazing woman who we've appointed director of this department who I know knows many of the panelists. Uh, Mariela Angel Ruiz is now our city's first director of this department, and we'll put her information in the chat box. But this department is, uh, we have about 10 social workers now. We have three kind of managers running it. Uh, and we just got 10 million from city council last night uh, to staff up to 40 social workers. And really, I think in the fall, this is like literally going to be happening. Like I will just call 911 and test it out. I mean, I actually shouldn't do that. You should never do that with 911, but uh, we will make sure that it is a reality, I think this fall. And that's very, very exciting for our city. I wanna pause and mention a little bit about what, uh, why we did this. Uh, it is because of the, frankly, the political will that uh, George Floyd, the incident gave us. Uh, my administration wanted to do this, but we didn't have the, you know, that sort of, whether it's pushing it through council or whether it's convincing the public that this is important. Uh, it really was last summer that enabled our city to do this. And a lot of community members obviously made that push. And so this really is a result of a community standing up for a different way to do things and a, uh, a way that in, in some hopefully small way, right, reduces the criminalization of an automatic police response or the militarization of a uh, firearm and a badge and a police car that shows up at your door. Uh, these are the longer term trauma issues that we're hoping to, you know, gradually move away from, right, with a more appropriate response and a more community appropriate response. And so uh, I think, you know, for us, it is about reimagining uh, public safety by definition, because we imagine and we will now have someone different at your door, someone who is trained and someone who understands community and someone who is not a threat for escalation and someone hopefully who has a little less historical racist baggage just in terms of society. And so uh, that's our goal. And we are, uh, again, in a situation where the department is, is live and that it exists, it has leaders, it has people. And come the fall, I think it will actually be um, uh, totally active in terms of our 911 system. So I think with that, I, I would just wrap it up by saying that, uh, you know, for us, it's also an experiment. I think we, and, and hopefully my community <laughs> agrees with us on this, but, we are going to try this. It is going to be real and is gonna be uh, a, a different way of literally running the whole city. That is going to happen. I believe it's gonna work. It might not. We're open to that. We're open to adjusting it as we go forward. And I think we're coming into it with humility, but we are coming into it with action. Uh, there is nothing about words and uh, talking points uh, in terms of comparing this to an actual 911 response. That is fundamentally a different way to run a city. 
So I very much hope it works. We will see, and I appreciate the time on the panel. And Mariella also is gonna be, uh, she'll be with uh, this uh, crew uh, for the remainder of the session. So she's obviously the expert among her team. And so if there are specific questions too, she can be available. And we'll put a couple of links in there uh, to the, the site that explains all this and so forth. So very much appreciate the conference too for giving us this space. Thank you very much, Mayor Keller. Uh, Carol Mason, Marcus Ellis, and uh, Michael Sean Spence for really hoping to kind of frame what the solutions can look like. And I think you're 100% right, uh, Mayor. This is, we know some stuff that works. Some of this is experimenting and, and we're invested in innovation. Uh, and I think that's a lot that I hear from mayors across the country is that we want to innovate. We want to do new things, but doing that in partnership with community and using your political will and the public will to really advance this issue, I think is the way to go. And if folks, are on this call and don't have, one of the things I did not say in my opening remarks, I, uh, I opened up the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods for Mayor Fisher, if it's still up and running. Uh, these offices are important to cities. Uh, the one that you heard Marcus talk about. So if you don't have an Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods, an Office for uh, Community Engagement, an Office for Community Safety, you need one. And you need to have one that has uh, talented folks who know how to do systems level work, but also know how to connect to those in community. Uh, and making sure that you not only have that office, but you invest in that office and you give that office the resources it needs uh, to do the work. So one of the things that you heard uh, consistently through this call, the federal government has put resources on the table that can really help us build out our infrastructure on the ground in communities, right? So using those resources to build out your office, to invest in the community-based uh, work that's taking place so that those folks who have been doing this work uh, for free at times of the resources that they need to take care of themselves and their families. You heard Eddie and Dr. Bugs in the first panel talk about that. So we have an opportunity uh, to really uh, invest in peace, invest in work that we know that work, but also to Mayor Keller's point, be innovative and try new things because what we've been investing in over years is not working. We have way too many young people down in our streets and it's happening in black and brown communities. So we need to address that issue and we need to invest in the folks and the people. Uh, as you heard Curl talk about, this is about affordable, safe and stable housing. This is about making sure that all of our kids are being educated and getting the right education. This is about making sure that families have access to livable wage jobs. This is about healthcare, not just physical, but mental. We need to make sure that we're dealing with the trauma as you heard Mayor Schaaf talk about earlier, that we're addressing the ACEs and we're addressing the childhood trauma and that's community trauma. And we also got to address how that community trauma continues to happen. And that's because we have not dealt with the racist uh, structure that we are dealing with as a country. So we got a lot of work to do, but we're at a prime place to really move an issue forward and really to say, if we really truly want to make sure that kids stay alive, we need to adjust the way that we invest our resources. So now is that time. Uh, the, the call is here, the space is here, and we have resources to do that. Uh, we have about three minutes left, two minutes left. I might be able to get one question in, Mayor Fisher, uh, but I know uh, we are running at it. We're running up against time, but it was just really want to thank the panel for their their amazing framing and all the information. And we did put a lot of links in the chat box, so make sure that you go get all the reports that were talked about, all of the work that you heard about. Uh, and Mayor, your uh, your team did put you all stuff in the chat box as well, so it's there. So, Mayor Fisher, I got time for any questions. If you see anything pop up in the panel for any of our uh, listeners there, it looks like we've got a lot of people sharing information right now and trying to learn uh, together, Anthony, but I don't see a specific uh, question on here right now. So maybe we ought to give ourselves a break and, and finish on time for once. How's that sound? <laughs> That's all right. That sounds good. I appreciate it. And again, thank you all uh, for this time and space. But mayors, as Mayor, as Carol said, this is the time to really move and really, really not only Think about reimagining public safety, but really actually using these resources in this time. To Can I add one thing, Anthony? Yes, ma'am. You know, yeah. not to, so, you know, I mentioned these pockets of money coming in and, and hoping that you all will be strategic and thoughtful about them and think about how to stretch them to, to, to supplement other money so that this work can continue and that it doesn't stop when the federal money is exhausted, because that's part of the paradigm change we need to make is that you all need to commit to this work permanently, not as not only as long as the federal money is available. And so with this huge investment that's coming from the federal government, really work with your school systems, work with your governors, mayors, everybody 
outside of their silos to figure out how are you all going to collectively move this work forward with this um, opportunity we have with this money to really make a big change. Thank you for reiterating that. Really do and thank you, Carol. One other thing, Anthony, tomorrow, one of our sessions will be about uh, mayors and cities, where are the multiple avenues uh, that are out there and how monies can be secured for this work. So it'll be more of a workshop to bring everybody up to speed on that opportunity. So every town is helping us uh, with that. So be a very practical session for us tomorrow. Very timely. Appreciate it. And again, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Fisher, U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, in every town for the partnership uh, and for convening such a timely summit uh, for this conversation to take place. Very good. We'll, uh, we'll take a break and we'll be reconvening at three o'clock. Again, Anthony Smith, Cities United, thanks for putting this session together. Thanks for all of our guests here and we'll be talking more. Thanks everybody. Back at three.
Hey, Jerry. Yes, Gene, how are Jane you? Castro. Can you see me? I can see you. Oh, okay. I can't see mine. I just want to make sure I was uh, logged on here. Good how are you? Yeah, good. And I'll say hello to all the guests. It's Greg Fisher here. We're live on YouTube right now, which uh, doesn't, we, none of us would say anything inappropriate, but just FYI. <laughs> and then, I don't know. The yeah. previous police officers, man. Well, that's true, you know. Uh, <laughs> hey, Greg. Uh, thanks so much, the mayor, for for everybody uh, for participating. And I'll kick it off right at three o'clock here in about Excellent. a minute or two. All right, welcome back everybody to our final session of day one. As I said at our opening today, we're working to address multiple challenges at once, including obviously this historic and horrifying increase in gun violence and gun homicides that we see going on across America. And that's taking place at the, at the long the backdrop that we have for reimagining public safety to strengthen police community trust. And this is work that the United States Conference of Mayors knows very well in the wake of cries for racial justice that we heard in more than 2,000 cities across America last year following the tragic killings of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor here in my hometown of Louisville, and far too, other, far too many other black men and women at the hands of law enforcement. The conference asked a group of compassionate, experienced, and visionary leaders to accept the challenge of putting together a thoughtful, comprehensive uh, plan for police reform. And they did. Our United States Conference of Mayors Working Group on Police Reform and Racial Justice was led by Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Cincinnati Mayor John Cranley, and Tampa Mayor Jane Castor. They put together a bipartisan set of recommendations as part of a document called Mayor's 2020 Vision, an American Breakthrough. And we released our American Breakthrough Plan last summer and have shared it with lawmakers and law enforcement professionals and experts around the country. And those recommendations are now part of the national conversation for how we all move forward in our cities and all across our country to reimagine public safety. So to talk more about these recommendations and where we go from here, we'll begin this session by hearing from two of the leaders of the working group. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot could not join us live here today, so she sent in a video message. So if you'll play that and then we'll take the program from there. So Mayor Lightfoot's video will follow now. I'm Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I'm proud to be the 56th mayor of the great city of Chicago. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the Summit on Reimagining Public Safety's Session on Police Reform. Almost a year ago, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and long-standing concerns about the nature and effects of policing involving black Americans and other residents of color, I, along with Mayors John Cranley and Jane Castor, were charged with leading USCM's Police Reform and Racial Justice Working Group to take an honest look at the policing and racial justice problems our cities were confronting. We collaborated on and debated about how best to address these challenges and ultimately agreed on a set of principles and recommendations to bring about holistic change within police departments across the country. With great pride, 
re-released the police reform racial justice report in August 2020, which now serves as a resource for mayors from all kinds of cities as they tackle the issues of police violence and racial discrimination within their cities. These are issues that can't be solved in a matter of days and in some instances, a matter of years. But this report provides actionable, meaningful steps, a toolkit toward fully addressing them once and for all. The report is built on a number of foundational principles. The first principle, trust and legitimacy, is at the foundation of this entire report. We know this, trust is a two-way street and the bedrock for everything we hope to accomplish. In order for policing to be effective, our police must have public approval, legitimacy, and that stems from trust. That's why this first principle focuses on finding a common ground between our residents and the police, a space where the police earn the public's trust and the public respects police as legitimate guardians of their communities. The second principle, redefining the role of local police and public safety, calls on us to work with our communities to redefine the proper role of the police who cannot and should not be the first responder in every situation. We must meet community needs with proper funding and investment and avoid inserting police into roles where they are not suited and they are not and should not be the primary or only responder to issues impacting the public where others could be more effective. The third principle, sanctity of life, is at the core of a police officer's responsibilities and requires officers to intervene when a fellow officer is using disproportionate or unnecessary force. Now, we all know this. Officers have a duty to protect all human life and physical safety, which is why this principle also calls for use of force policies and training programs to ban chokeholds, include de-escalation and critical incident training, peer intervention training, and so much more. The fourth principle, equality and due process, requires that all people, no matter their circumstances, be treated fairly with respect to their constitutional rights and due process of law. To ensure this equal and just treatment, police departments must provide consistent training on impartial policing, anti-discrimination principles, and cultural literacy, as well as bring in community members as teachers in the training process. The fifth principle, community, reinforces the idea that the most powerful tool an officer can possess is respectful, constitutional engagement with the community and calls on them to work hard to develop real, authentic relationships with community members, as well as strive for department demographics to be reflective of the communities they serve. And finally, the sixth principle, transparency and accountability to reinforce constitutional policing. This works to ensure that police fulfill their commitments to protect the residents they serve and that the police build trust and legitimacy also through transparency, engagement, and accountability. As you listen to the other speakers on this panel <clears throat> and tune into the rest of the summit, it's certainly my hope and expectation that you will keep these principles in mind, especially as you think about how to bring about meaningful change in your own cities. Because no one, no matter their circumstances, deserves to have their life unfairly ripped away, especially at the hands of the police. And we owe it to our residents and our communities who we are so lucky to serve, to do everything in our power to make sure that we are supporting them and reflecting their lived experience and everything we do, which starts with respect and sanctity of life. Thank you all so very much. Enjoy the summit. Thank you, Mayor Lightfoot, I appreciate that. And now to lead the discussion, I'll give the floor to another co-chair of the Working Group on Police Reform and Racial Justice who has a very unique and qualified background to address this topic because she is the former uh, Chief of Police of Tampa PD and is now the Mayor of the great city of Tampa, Jane Castor. Jane, take it away. Thank you, thank you very much, Mayor Fisher, and thank you for organizing this. Uh, critically uh, timed summit. And uh, it was quite an honor for me to be a part of the working group on police reform and racial justice. 
I also want to um, acknowledge uh, Mayor Cranley from Cincinnati and also the law enforcement professionals that we had that played a significant part. And that included uh, the police commissioner from Baltimore, Michael Harrison, the police chief from Phoenix, Jerry Williams, and also the police chief from uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Skip Holbrook. And as, as you heard Mayor Lightfoot put so eloquently, not only um, the, the elements of our findings and our ultimately our report, but also the significance of those in ensuring that um, we have equitable policing throughout uh, the United States. And it, it really is critically important. As was stated, I was with the Tampa Police Department for 30 years. And what I would like to have the uh, mayors on this, this uh, broadcast right now here is that all of the, this information is available to you and please, please educate yourself read these reports and see what the best practices are across the nation and things that can be implemented in your own backyard. So um, I thank also Carol Mason. I saw her presentation and she talked about the reports that she held up. We have some of the authors of those will be uh, speaking with you shortly. And all of these reports are available on the U.S. Conference of um, Mayors website. So please go to those and, and uh, read these particular uh, reports. This is an uh, extremely challenging time, not just with the COVID, but with a lot of the civil unrest that we have seen over the, the year. And the earlier sessions today uh, talked about the incredible gun violence. Uh, there are very few cities across the nation that have not seen an incredible spike in gun violence. So this session, we are going to focus directly on police reform. And I am uh, very excited to hear from our panelists. And I'll just give you an overview of the individuals that you're gonna be hearing from. Um, Michael Smith is the uh, Director of Youth Opportunity Programs at the Obama Foundation and Executive Director of My Brother's Keeper Alliance and is leading the Foundation's Reimaging uh, Policing Initiative and you heard uh, Carol Mason actually saw her hold up uh, that report. Unfortunately, Chief C.J. Davis could not join us, but as the past president of Noble, uh, she worked hand in hand with um, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and produced an excellent report that you also saw, The Future of Public Safety. Uh, Dr. Philip um, Atiba Gall is the co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity. He is also the Carl I. Hoagland Professor of African American Studies and the, uh, a professor of psychology at Yale. In addition, he um, has developed a policy plan for policing in America and is also working with police departments throughout the country on implementing some of the elements of that particular uh, plan. As I mentioned, each of those plans are on the website uh, for U.S. Conference of Mayors. We also have Brandon Scott here, who's the mayor of Baltimore, and I'm sure he will uh, bring some of, of Chief Harrison's uh, ideas forward as well. And he's been involved in the city's police reform efforts, both during his time on council and since he has become the mayor. And then also Jerry Dyer, uh, just like uh, myself, he was the chief of police prior to becoming the mayor of Fresno. And uh, he is going to bring us insight from both of those perspectives. After we hear from all of our speakers, hopefully we'll have enough time for some questions from mayors and, and key city officials. And please don't hesitate to enter your questions into, uh, we all know by now on these, these uh, web meetings, virtual meetings, how to ask questions. So please uh, provide your input. We want this to be interactive. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Michael, take it away. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. It is really an honor and a privilege to have an opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, it's wonderful to see so many uh, mayors that are my brother's keeper mayors who have been supporting this work for so long. And so on behalf of President Obama and the entire Obama Foundation and my brother's keeper family, I just want to say thank you um, to all of you that are on the screen and all of you that are watching for the number of years that you've been uh, along with us on this mission to make sure our young people can achieve their dreams. Um, I'll talk to you just a little bit about um, why we got into this work. First of all, if you don't know the work of My Brother's Keeper, um, My Brother's Keeper was founded for a couple different reasons. One, it was founded in the aftermath of the tragic killing of Trayvon Martin, uh, and then the shocking verdict in the trial where his murderer was acquitted. Uh, and at that time, President Obama said, there has to be more that we can do to make sure that young men of color in this country know that their country cares about them and is willing to invest in them. Um, at around the same time, we were seeing some shocking opportunity gaps uh, for young men of color. If you were Black, Latinx, or tribal, um, almost every key indicator of long-term life success, systemic racism was challenging uh, what our young men could succeed, what our young men could do to succeed and achieve their dreams. And so those two things came together to launch My Brother's Keeper back in 2014. Today, we exist to address these pers persistent opportunity gaps and to make sure uh, that all young people can reach their dreams. Uh, we're doing that work now in three different buckets. One, we're working in a targeted set of communities across the country uh, to accelerate impact and really lift up models. Second, we're working with a network of more than 250 My Brother's Keeper communities uh, in almost every single state, 19 tribal nations, D.C. and Puerto Rico, uh, that are all putting out their own plans of action to make sure that there's a clear pathway to opportunity for boys and young men of color. And the other thing that we do is we try to make sure that we mobilize individuals and institutions to get involved in this work because this is not work that's just about our heart. It is about our head. If America is going to remain globally competitive, then our young men of color need to be able to succeed. So in that area of mobilizing, this past summer, we saw all of the indicators as to why we created My Brother's Keeper in the first place. Systemic racism was leading to horrible odds. We saw it in the disproportionate impact in uh, the pandemic, and we saw it again in the disproportionate impact of police violence. We know the stats. Police have killed a thousand uh, folks uh, in a year for the past five, four years. And if you're black and native, you're looking at rates that are three times or almost three times more high. And so we got together and we created created the Reimagining Policing Pledge. We work with folks like my good friend Anthony Smith uh, from Cities United uh, with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights with John Jay College. And we said we need to do something to make sure that folks aren't just saying Black Lives Matter, but at the end of all of this, we actually see policy change that shows that Black Lives Matter. Uh, so we put together this pledge. We asked for mayors and county executives and local elected officials uh, to get together with their communities, review the use of force policies, and within 90 days begin to announce reforms that could be made. We didn't say exactly what needed to be done, but we tried to lift up work we had done uh, with President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force. We looked at best practices and innovations across the nation. We brought together some leading expertise from co-founders of Black Lives Matter uh, to folks like Dr. Goff, who, you, who you're seeing on the screen, and we tried to be a partner uh, with mayors across the country. And we've been happy to see more than 337 cities uh, have taken the Reimagining Policing Pledge. And I think last year, for many of us, we didn't know was this going to lead to lasting change. And we've actually been able to sit back, and I think the mayors you're hearing from today will show that there's been real significant change. You can visit our website uh, to see at Obama.org, and you could see our Reimagining Policing Pledge report. Uh, but what we found were a couple different things. We saw uh, folks engaging residents in new ways, having to figure out how to work through this global pandemic, using new technologies, uh, creating new commissions and tax forces. Uh, we saw reviewing and updating of use of force policies, banning chokeholds and out, uh, uh, other types of deadly force. We saw a reevaluation of policies. Um, we saw increased transparency and posting of use of force data. Uh, we also saw a lot of new programs that were being created, which you can read about in our Reimagining Policing Pledge report. Uh, new offices that were being created, uh, directors of gun violence prevention, a real connection between the work of policing and public safety, um, new navigation services, 
uh, new pairing of uh, law enforcement officials with human service experts. And then we also saw uh, reforming budgets. Uh, where we were seeing more dollars that were coming into policing and public safety, and we were seeing some dollars being diverted uh, to help with the burden that police departments are feeling uh, when they have to respond to so many things that are not within their original scope. Um, so what is next for this work? We are committed to working with Cities United, working with our other partners to continue to provide a place where folks can learn in an honest and candid atmosphere, uh, where we can connect you with resources to help you uh, to plan for the future. Um, and we hope that more mayors will take our reimagining policing pledge. There is plenty of room. There are plenty of opportunities to learn and grow together. And to the mayors that have already taken the policing pledge, don't take your foot off the gas. We're already seeing some polling data out there that's showing um, that some Americans are getting tired of talking about race and racism. Um, you know, we didn't get here overnight and we're not going to move out of the situation overnight. This is life cycle work, not political cycle work. And so I ask that you continue to be brave, continue to be courageous, uh, and we will work uh, with right alongside with you. I'll close uh, with a quote from Congressman Lewis when we actually launched uh, our reimagining policing pledge that same week, uh, we had a forum, which was one of Congressman Lewis's last forum. And he said, we're going to get there. It's all going to work out, uh, but we must help it work out. We must continue to be bold, brave, courageous, push and pull to redeem the soul of America and move closer to a community at peace with itself. So help us get in good trouble, help us make that change together, uh, and we will promise to continue to be partners with you uh, in all 250 plus My Brother's Keeper communities across the country. Thank you. And next we are turning it over to Dr. Scott, or I'm sorry, Dr. Golf. That's okay. I'm happy to switch jobs um, with uh, Mayor, <laughs> no, Mayor Scott at some so. point. Um, if he wants to grade some papers this week, uh, <laughs> we can do that. No, we're good. All right. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, uh, Mayor Castor. Um, thank you, U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, uh, always difficult to, to follow my brother from another mother, uh, Michael Smith, um, but good to be here with you. It's good to be here with mentors, um, friends, and even with some students, um, uh, which is just, it's just lovely. Um, that said, let me dive in just a little bit, tell you a little bit about the background of the Center for Policing Equity um, and the work that we see in front of us. Um, so I'm the, the co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity. What we do functionally is we, we work to make policing less deadly, less racist, and oftentimes less present where it does not need to be. And we do this by leveraging behavioral and data science. So our hashtag is we are the justice nerds. I am a nerd professionally. I'm also a nerd in my spare time. Um, we do this in large part um, with the help of the National Justice Database, um, which, as Michael knows, is the largest uh, repository of police behavioral data in the world. Um, it's a very humble brag, um, but prior to 2012, when we got started, there were no national data on what police did. We collected data on crime poorly as they're kept, but there were no national data on what police did. I want to be really clear, that National Justice Database that we worked through, that was at the request of law enforcement. In 2012, shortly after the death of, of Trayvon Martin, we, we convened a, a meeting of law enforcement and academics at the Office of Justice Programs, and law enforcement said out loud, we are cowards if we don't partner with nerds, and they did use that word, which hurt our feelings just a little bit. We don't partner with nerds to find out how are we doing and how do we get better? And the idea that we can be led by evidence is, is one that's not revolutionary, but it would constitute a revolution in the context of public safety. So we've taken that and worked with hundreds of departments across the country. And our track record at reducing bad outcomes is pretty decent. In the places where we've worked um, in a high touch way, uh, we've seen arrests fall by 25%, use of force fall by 26%, and officer related injuries fall by 13%. But all of that work that we've done to give back to police departments and communities, not just racial disparities, but the portion of those disparities that belong to law enforcement, that's not large enough for this moment. In this moment, we have incredible, incredible tension, as you all know. But the deal is our diagnoses are not intention. It's the people that are intention. We agree about a great deal happening in policing. It's in the report that the US Conference of Mayors put together. And when activists say it, it sounds different than when law enforcement says it, but it is the same thing. When activists say it, it can come out as defund or abolish. When police chiefs say it, it can come out as the need to reform or support police. But what folks are agreeing on is we ask police to do too much 
right? The data support this. And if we remove police from the situations where they don't want to go in, where they can't possibly be trained as, uh, uh, the same way that social service folks can be trained, we can garner that trust uh, of uh, local communities. We can reduce officer related injuries. We can reduce civilian related injuries and we can give back to communities the resources for them to keep themselves safe. So in this space where we agree on a great deal, but we are disagreeable with each other, the question becomes how to get that done. I'll lift up for you very quickly because I know my time is running out. One example, in New York State, the governor said, everybody's got to come up with a new plan. And there are two plans I want to highlight, one in Long Island, one in Ithaca and Tompkins County, New York. In Long Island, they decided to reimagine public safety by doing reform, by pulling police out of schools, but also by tracking not just crime, but measuring justice. And they used some nerds to help them get that done. It looked like standard reform and 21st century stuff, but turbocharged. In Ithaca, they decided we don't want a police department anymore. What we want is a department of community solutions and public safety. And the thing I wanna hold up is not just that they did something that might feel scary in the context of a murder spike across the country, but they did it. And two days before it passed, the Police Benevolent Association said, here's what we endorse from that plan and remain silent on everything else. They did it as a community the folks who were most vulnerable, the folks who had the most money, and the Police Benevolent Association coming together. It's possible, and one of the ways it becomes possible, when you have science as the table, then people can trust a process when they can't trust each other. I cannot overstate, we agree as a country on a lot of what needs to happen next. We don't agree, we are, we are in tension with each other, even though our diagnoses are not. So we need processes that help to get those tensions out of the way, so we can make good on the promise that we owe to the people who are still hurting from all of the death that we've seen since this summer. I should give up my time right there because no one likes a professor to go too long. And I think I get to pass off uh, to my, my brother, Mayor Scott. Thank you, doctor. And thank you for not uh, forcing me to grade papers, which is something I never, never want to do unless I have to. Uh, but I think uh, what the doctor and everyone is saying is, is, spot, is spot on. And when you think about what we've been through uh, forever here in this country, but really over the last few years, the tragic murder of George Floyd and the tragic death of Breonna Taylor uh, really provided a gut check for this nation. And it forced mayors into reimagining public safety and, and policing. And the push uh, to reimagine were further galvanized by the footage we all saw with the U.S. Army Lieutenant in Virginia. But the reality is, is that in the moment we're in, defining what policing looks like is the most consequential decision any local government can make. I accepted that charge as Baltimore's mayor and long before when I was a councilman. And I've witnessed firsthand how violence can plague a community. I always say to folks that I got into public service because I live uh, lived in a neighborhood known as Park Heights in Baltimore that the world descends on for a horse race no, known as Preakness and every other day that I wasn't even seen as human. I saw my first shooting before I was 10 years old and that perpetual pain and suffering that so many people uh, shapes the black experience with people growing up here in Baltimore and cities around the country and we know the status quo for policing and public safety do not work. We've been trying them as long as I've been breathing and it has not solved the problems. They didn't work yesterday, they don't work today, and they're not gonna work tomorrow. Yet, uh, as we're in this moment and May has charted a new path for public safety, uh, we are frequently met with uninformed and, and unreasonable rhetoric uh, from the past. And what really is reimagining public safety? It's not simply about these hashtags or defunding the police or, or keep funding the police or whatever. It's really about, at its core, uh, the science, as Dr. Golf was saying, it's really about addressing the root causes of crime and widespread gun violence that has infected cities in, um, in America, including my city, for my entire life. Curing violence is only possible if our city governments is, are concentrated and recognizes that police departments cannot solve this complex matter alone. We have been overburdening them with things that they are not equipped to deal with. Uh, for example, here in Baltimore, the women and men of the Baltimore Police Department are not substance abuse counselors in a city that loses more people to overdose than we do to gun violence. They are not mental health or trauma counselors. Yet, 
Uh, they receive over 13,000 emergency calls annual uh, related to behavioral health issues. And uh, for me, it's, it's funny, but also sad that in the city that has Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, some of the most wonderful trained mental health clinicians you can find in the world, we are leaning on the police to answer those calls. That's not the right way to go. And this is why we have started here in Baltimore a 911 diversion pilot program uh, that would divert a thousand of those calls away directly to the folks that are trained to deal with that. And that's just a first step. And we must also keep uh, this kind of energy for other types of calls so that we can create that pathway of reimagining public safety. For us here, it also means that we're going to continue to follow our consent decree. We have one of the nation's most sweeping federal consent decree uh, that came out of uh, the death of Freddie Gray in 2015. And for me, reimagining public safety means fulfilling those requirements without cutting any corners and by establishing a fiscal blueprint rooted in oversight and accountability. Using data, one of my primary commitments to public safety is about getting the work that we do right. And part of my vision is using data to track that performance and change direction when necessary, not to go decades doing the same thing that the data tells you isn't working, holding every agency accountable for producing public safety through uh, a creation of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety Engagement. And also uh, our Violent Reduction Task Force, refocusing those efforts on addressing the root causes of the issues. For example, the health department has been convening, the health commission and the health department is convening a violence reduction task force to develop a public health informed framework for preventing violence in our city. And we can do that while also focusing on the other side. It doesn't have to be an either or that you're gonna talk about uh, the root causes or dealing with the immediacy of violence at the same time. You can do both. Mayors can do both. We just have to have the carers to do it. And that's also the way we're gonna be doing that while continuing to do things like, for example, focusing on gun trafficking. Uh, here in Baltimore City, 63% of the weapons we recovered last year came from another state. But there was no direction to our police department to do anything, to partner with ATF or anyone to deal with that those issues. We are now having a unit specifically to do just that because we have to make sure that we are curing violence at every turn at all costs. It's personal for me because I've lived it. It's different when you had to duck the bullet so you had the gun in your face. You understand it. My heart breaks every time someone loses their life to violence, but I also know that we cannot go back. The status quo will not work. We're gonna have to push ourselves. We're gonna have to be uncomfortable. We're gonna have to make people mad at us because the urgency of this moment uh, requires courage and the will to do better. And we as leaders must accept this challenge to reimagine public safety, to honor the lives of countless black men, people of color, women, children, boys, girls, who have lost their lives in this country. They didn't have to because uh, we were overcommitted to either a, a failed war on drugs or under investing in neighborhoods and not providing the services. It's time that we do both and build this equitable approach towards government. Thank, Thank you very much, Mayor. And now we're gonna turn it over to Mayor Dyer from Fresno. Thank you, uh, Mayor Castro, I appreciate it very much. It's an honor to be a part of this panel. And I wanna uh, welcome all of the folks that are, uh, that are watching or listening in. Uh, you know, after spending 40 years in, in law enforcement in Fresno Police Department, uh, the last 18 years as a police chief, I, I've had a, a firsthand look at, at uh, the evolution of, uh, of the profession. And uh, what I've seen is that uh, uh, many agencies have uh, made significant progress uh, across the nation, while unfortunately others have, for whatever reason, uh, resisted that change, uh, as well as police reforms. Uh, and it's my belief that uh, when one agency uh, fails to reform, uh, not only does that have, uh, or does that agency come under scrutiny, uh, so does all of law enforcement. Uh, and the same holds true that when one officer is caught on camera uh, abusing their authority, uh, every police officer uh, becomes suspect. Uh, and when this happens frequently, uh, the entire profession uh, begins to be called into question, which I think is 
what has happened this last year in our nation. And so um, state and national standards, policies and training uh, must be consistent across our country, uh, even though I recognize the fact that every community is unique. And so reimagining law enforcement uh, for me uh, must begin with who we are looking for to serve as our police officers in terms of um, what qualities, what personalities, uh, those things are critical. Uh, how do we want our police officers to perform? Uh, what types of calls do we want them to handle? Uh, how should they dress? Uh, what equipment should they be provided? Uh, how should our police officers be armed uh, to protect them, themselves and others? And um, perhaps most importantly, how should they be trained? Uh, there are a lot of scholars, uh, advocates, and elected officials out there today trying to uh, reimagine and ultimately reform policing today, which I agree is much needed. Um, some of these efforts are being done, unfortunately, from a bias, uh, such as those who um, wish to defund police, uh, while others are, are very well intentioned. Um, and one of the things that I want to mention is that uh, even well intentioned efforts to reimagine policing uh, could have some devastating impacts on communities uh, in terms of crime, if we're not careful. Uh, after seeing many years of uh, violent crime across this nation, be reduced, we're now seeing crime escalate uh, across America. Uh, the simple fact is uh, that we live in a very, very violent society. And police officers uh, are the ones that we rely on to keep us safe. Uh, and we cannot lose sight of the fact that as we reimagine and as we reform, uh, reform policing, the end game is to keep people safe while maintaining the trust of the community. Uh, reimagining public safety or community safety, uh, I believe, must begin with reimagining the expectations that we as a community have of policing. Uh, I believe we've asked police officers to do far too much uh, for far too long. Police officers cannot be seen as a, as a solution to every single societal ill. Uh, police departments across the nation have become the go-to person or default because of the convenient 24 hour hotline called 911. So we must establish uh, other 24 hour hotlines to divert police away from calls and situations that frequently escalate into officers use of force and unfortunately deadly force. For example, police officers should have very limited roles in dealing with the homeless, uh, mental health and suicide calls, adolescent misbehavior, and neighborhood dispute as, disputes as well as many others. Uh, and that is not what police departments were created for. However, over time, uh, police departments found themselves uh, receiving more and more of these types of calls. And what might happen, uh, quite frankly, if the police department chose not to send an officer uh, to one of those calls and something tragic happened, well, we can only imagine what the headlines might be. The largest influx, uh, I believe, of these types of calls uh, in terms of influx to the police department occurred uh, during the recession uh, when many governmental agencies and nonprofit groups uh, eliminated or uh, reduced their service levels. Uh, in turn, those calls got uh, rerouted uh, to 911 centers. Uh, Reimagining the role of the 911 center and the types of calls handled by police is critical. For example, uh, in Fresno, we've created a homeless assistance response team uh, called HART, uh, being established uh, out of the mayor's office to minimize contact between police officers and the homeless population uh, by utilizing outreach workers as the primary point of contact on homeless encampments. The same approach must be taken with the use of mental health clinicians, uh, a co-response by crisis intervention teams uh, comprised of clinicians and uh, Non-uniformed police officers need to be expanded upon in law enforcement. We have our own crisis intervention teams in Fresno. Uh, we co-locate and co-respond with uh, crisis intervention workers to mental health calls. When possible, the uh, clinician should be the primary point of contact and the police officer's role should be very, very limited. Uh, the role of school resource officers must also be reimagined across the nation as well as the expectations 
of school administrators have on our officers. Far too often, officers on school campuses are used to enforce school policies when their primary role should be to keep students and faculty safe. The reimagining of search warrants serviced by police officers and tactical teams should also occur, as well as, uh, as well as how special weapons and tactics teams are used. Not only should no knock a search warrants, that's uh, entering a residence without knocking and noticing, uh, should be eliminated in law enforcement completely. Dynamic entry should only be done to preserve life and not to preserve evidence as we see in many agencies across the nation still practicing that. Having uh, worked in the narcotics unit and on the SWAT team in the past, I understand the dangers that these incidents pose to officers and citizens. We must also reimagine the hiring and rehiring process of police officers. More stringent guidelines must be established to prevent police officers who are terminated for cause or resign in lieu of termination uh, from one department from being hired by another law enforcement agency. State and national databases need to be established and serve as a clearinghouse to law enforcement agencies doing background checks on candidates. If the person in the database is in the database, they should not be hired by another law enforcement agency, plain and simple. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we must reimagine how police officers are trained from the academy to in-service training. I've been a long, uh, long time advocate of transitioning away from the military type police academy training that required cadets to stand in formation and march. Police officers are not part of the military. They're part of the community. Police academies, must be reimagined as a whole across our country. Compassion, empathy, customer service, and relationship building must be the emphasis of the training of our police officers, not only when they enter the profession, but through in-service training as well. Thank you. All right, excellent comments from the entire panel. Thank you so much. Um, to elaborate on uh, Mayor Dyer's comments and several others, I think Dr. Goff alluded to it as well, is that we do ask the police to do too much. And as we underfund social services, they don't fit neatly in another area, they come to law enforcement. And so as a nation, we need to be aware of that and we need to focus as mayors, we need to focus on that service provision. And I think a lot of us are uh, currently doing that. Also something that was alluded to is that law enforcement is judged as a whole. Um, something like the murder of George Floyd occurs and every police officer in America is blamed for that. And that uh, is accepted. I know by having been a, a police officer, that's just a, a fact of life for those in law enforcement. But what we need to do is focus as a nation, and this is in, in the U.S. Commerce of Mayors of Policing Reform Report, the um, uh, 2020 focus, is to look at those national training standards and to look at those policies and procedures that can be utilized by all law enforcement. Uh, Mayor Dyer brought up some good uh, points on search warrants. You know, some simple things that you can look at that can really prevent these types of national incidents from occurring moving forward, being preventative as opposed to responsive and being incredibly surgical. A very small number of individuals in every community commit the vast majority of the crime. And then also to Dr. Goff's uh, point, I thought that he made excellent points about the need for, it can never be an us against them. We are all in this together. And we have to look at that cooperation, that collaboration uh, between law enforcement, academics, uh, businesses, but most importantly, with our residents. You have got to have those relationships, day-to-day -day relationships, where there is an understanding of the role that everyone plays in a community. So I thank each and every one of you for uh, your participation here today. Uh, this has been very, very enlightening. I know that uh, Mayor Dyer, one of the attendees, Kate uh, Collin, would like to know if you have 
any type of a link to your heart uh, program in Fresno. So if you could share that with the US Conference of Mayors, then we'll ensure that she receives that. But we have just excellent comments and I am so very appreciative of each and every one of you. Again, I would ask that everyone on this call avail yourself to the information that is on the website uh, for the US Conference of Mayors. And let's make sure that this is a focus uh, as we move forward. I put together a task force uh, early on um, on police reform. And one of the things that we learned is we had made excellent relationships with the older generation in our community, but had neglected creating those positive working relationships with the younger generation. So when we brought them in, a lot of the activist groups uh, members into this task force for a series of meetings, they came up with 17 recommendations for the police department, most of which had already been implemented. So that's a lack of communication there, a lack of that relationship building. So we are all in this together. And again, I appreciate uh, everything that everyone has done. Before we go, I wanna mention that with the generous uh, support of the Target Corporation, the Conference of Mayors has launched a two-year $700,000 police reform and racial justice grant program that is designed to identify, support, and promote police policies and practices that are the most effective in advancing the goal of justice for all residents. The deadline for submission of the, the grant applications from cities is June 15th. So it's going to be approaching quickly. And the winners of the first year of the grant program will be announced in September at this year's annual meeting of the US Conference of Mayors in Austin. So I urge everyone to consider applying for these funds if you have not done so already. Uh, again, thanks to all of the excellent speakers and for the, everyone who has tuned in. Now let me turn it back to Mayor Fisher for some closing remarks. Thanks, Mayor Castor and to all of our panelists. We've got a few minutes here, so I wanted to introduce the uh, to, uh, discussion if we could have on qualified immunity. That's one of the things we wanted to touch today. And maybe if I could start by directing the question to Mayor Scott and then our other panelists think about this. Uh, Mayor Scott, the, the state of Maryland uh, recently changed its laws relative to qualified immunity for uh, policing in Maryland. If you could talk a little bit about the impact that you're seeing from that, and then maybe, maybe any of our other panelists uh, weighing in on that. So, Mayor Scott? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Fisher. I think that, that ours is a little more complicated than that way. Uh, we uh, were the first state to repeal what was known as the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Uh, there are many things in there. Qualified immunity is one of the things that is still going to be a discussion, but I think what the General Assembly did this year here in Maryland is a great step that the rest of the country really can, can look at, right? Our Senate President, in addition to our, our Speaker of the House, they were very, very intentional around the things that they were doing and, and focusing on. And it's not just about repealing things, but it's also about putting things in place, Mayor Fisher, Fisher that makes, makes uh, what folks would say a more of a even playing field and this is something that's important that they had to override our governor's vetoes in to do it for example uh now statewide in Maryland, you have to have uh, body cameras and use of force guidelines have been changed for everyone across the state uniform from county to county and baltimore city as we're independent city for us here as a city, we were a little further ahead because of our consent decree. Uh, and then uh, the Maryland Police Accountability Act, which is also known here as Anton's Law, changes how search warrants can be execute, executed, eliminating use of no-knock warrants, and allows for inspection of records relating to police conduct. We've opened up uh, what we call uh, some internal affairs records uh, here to the public. Uh, those kind of things are, are important here. Then, of course, the police... Performer Accountability Act 670, which repeals the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Uh, this, what we've seen here is folks have still gone to work. Many of these things haven't taken an effect as they can take into effect later. It is going to create, and what I think is important for mayors to know, in particular, Mayor Fisher, is that when you're doing these reforms, uh, we have to make sure that you're doing them in a way 
uh, that you understand what's going to happen, especially fiscally for cities, because these reforms, these policies, all of these things are going to cost money. They're not going to just go into effect and it's not going to just make it some easy thing. But also it's about how you communicate these things out. Uh, because for me, uh, being in city government now going on 15 years, overwhelmingly the complaints that I've gotten about bad cops have come from other police officers. Uh, we have to continue to allow uh, a infrastructure that allows more of them to feel comfortable so that we can hold people accountable, but also do it in a way that protects people who does their job the right way. I think that Maryland is on that path to, to having that balance of being able to hold folks accountable, but also not just allowing people who do their job each and every day than most people would not do to just be thrown away because someone doesn't like them. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments from the panelists on uh, the role of police officers, Bill of Rights? I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, uh, the one, the qualified immunity, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around that. You know, as long as individuals are, are acting in good faith, you know, there have always been uh, the, the sanctions for those officers that step out uh, of the, the legal realm of what they're doing. And I'll have to agree with the, the mayor about uh, the majority of the officers are doing the right thing and quite often mostly in sort of the northeast area where they have much stronger unions than we we have in the south that there are protections uh, that keep those officers that uh, shouldn't be wearing a badge that they are either allowing them to move from department to department or uh, they're covering up some of the misdeeds that they have done. So I agree with that. We need to take away all of those protections that are in place for those individuals that should never have worn a badge in the first place. And then we also need to have that framework, I would argue, on a national level, but state by state is a beginning to where you're looking at the policies, the procedures, and the training, ensuring that everyone has um, a very robust use of force policy. You're looking at search warrants when they are and aren't uh, allowed, the use of body-worn cameras to ensure that all of that is in place to protect those officers that are doing the right thing and, and you know, are out there serving the citizens every single day. And then, Mr. Mayor, and Madam Mayor, if I could just add to, for us to be and go specific, uh, this new uh, repeal for us now says that it creates a new legal standard that police here in Maryland can only use necessary and proportional force uh, in the law. Uh, also, uh, those who kill or seriously injure a person in our state as a result of excessive force can face up to 10 years in prison. Uh, that, that is something significant. Uh, that's a significant shift from where we were before. And while everyone may not be happy with that, uh, when you're when you're the family member of someone who lost their life that way, I think you will look at it in a significantly different way. One last thing on, on this, if we can, uh, around the Bill of Rights. Um, I think one of the things that I've, I'm seeing our communities ask for is literally visibility onto it. Also, bills of right, bills of rights have been passed with communities having no say and no visibility into it. So in this, in states like California, you've got it such that an officer's disciplinary record has to be expunged after two years. Well, when communities found out about that, they said, how on earth can we see patterns of bad officers if every two years it's a, it's a clean slate? We can't negotiate the necessary conditions for community trust away in our collective bargaining. That simply cannot be a condition of how unions engage or how state unions engage around this stuff. So sunlight needs to be a component of how any of this stuff is negotiated going forward. Very good. Thank you, Doc. And right, if folks. I could just add real quickly uh, from that quite often that negotiating away of, of um, you know, to the unions happens when cities are financially strapped and they don't have the ability to provide uh, raises to first responders. And so what happens is there's a great deal of give in those contracts that aren't necessarily viewed as negative at the time, but then the unintended consequences come up as they're implemented. So I agree 100% with you, uh, Dr. Gall. Yeah. Sorry, Mayor.
no problem. And then I'll just add an additional complication sometimes where state law preempts our ability at the local level to find that type of balance as well. So there's no question that uh, policing is at a crossroads in America right now. And I find, and certainly working with LMPD, that uh, the police officers that got into this to protect and serve, they're excited about it. And we're at this historic moment right now that we've got to get it right. And we can't look back like we did 50 years ago and got it wrong. We say today is our day. So it's an exciting time. That was the purpose of today's three sessions to elevate the whole concept about reimagining public safety, uh, about this being much more than just a law enforcement response. It's about the whole of city and the whole of community response. There's tremendous depth and quality of thinking going on in this area is evidenced here by our panel today. So Mayor Castor, I want to thank you for moderating our discussion and thank Michael Smith from the Obama Foundation who's been in this work a long time. Michael, thank you for the good work that you're doing. Uh, Dr. Goff, uh, you, you, you're, you're brief, but you're strong, man. So great job to you. We really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Uh, mayor Dyer, it's good to have you as a, as a new mayor and bringing that police chief perspective to that. And it's wonderful with Mayor Brandon Scott all the way on the other coast. We got East Coast, West Coast mayors uh, just showing the beauty and diversity of what it's like to be public officials and how all of that is what makes us better. So really appreciate everybody's participation here today. We'll reconvene tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern time for sessions on learning from the summer of 2020, building capacity in cities for peaceful protests, and two sessions on working with federal government and decreasing community violence including legislation and funding opportunities as well. So we look forward to those conversations. Thank everybody for joining us today, and we'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern. Be well.